one. Good afternoon. Uh, it's Wednesday, April 19th, and this is the Education and Culture Committee, our first uh, meeting on the operating budget for Montgomery County Public Schools. Um, uh, and it's uh, my first run as chair. I've done this a few times just as a committee member, but I, I will say as a, a proud MCPS parent and also the chair of this committee and member of this council, I don't think we've had a more important MCPS budget before us. Um, and uh, I know all the members of this committee and the council know that, uh, and I know we're going to get into this and talk about just what our students need, what our educators need, what our schools need to make sure that what we all want, and I have no doubt that all of us want the same thing, high quality, great schools, teaching and learning that address the needs and uh, the opportunities and the aspirations and the goals of our students. Um, and so we are all in, in alignment on that. And we're fortunate to have strong partners uh, in the Board of Education represented today by uh, President Silvestri and Superintendent McKnight and the panoply of MCPS. I think we've got a, a quarter of the administration here, um, and which we really appreciate, and the entire team. Just to just set level set so we know what we're going to do over the next uh, few weeks, this is the first of three sessions uh, to, to overview of the more than $3 billion operating budget for MCPS. Uh, today's session will focus as an overview of the request, and I know we'll turn it to MCPS shortly. We'll do a fiscal summary of where we are of revenues, something that we've started in expenditures, uh, and the CIP as well. And then we have two other uh, additional sessions on the operating budget, Wednesday, April 26th, and Thursday, May 4th. The April 26th session will focus on math and literacy, specifically the accelerator items that are requested in this budget. The May 4th session will focus on staffing, support services, restorative justice, and updates from previous sessions that council members have asked about. One of the things I said when we started this first ENC committee, we're going to follow up on things. We're going to be data-based. We're going to be looking at what is working and what's not, um, and how can we can improve. In addition to these sessions, uh, ENC will meet jointly with Chair Albernaz in the Health and Human Services Committee to talk about critical items like pre-kindergarten, early childhood education, uh, health services in school, linkages to learning, and other joint programs. Um, and as you know, this budget cuts over multiple committees. Um, and the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee will review compensation and benefit adjustments for all agencies along with evaluating the revenue adjustments that are proposed to support the MCPS budget. Uh, the council president has outlined the approach of how we're going to approach this budget in that the base will be the FY23 uh, budget, approved budget, and that all other tax supported additions will go on a reconciliation list, um, including even school funding. Uh, and it will be put into three, into two levels, uh, high priority or priority. Um, and that's something how we're, it's kind of new, we haven't done it that way, but that's how we'll be operating this year. Uh, our committees have also been asked to identify base budget reductions to the extent possible. And for, as I like to say, for the millions that are watching at home, we may actually have them today. Uh, the ENC committee will take up the question of funding recommendations, so the final answer uh, of what we are recommending to the full council of what level MCPS should be funded at, at the May 4th meeting just so we're clear on that. Um, part of that discussion, obviously, is connected to work that will happen at the full council related to the property tax. And that's something the county executive sent us a budget that proposes a 10% property tax increase to fund the schools. That would generate $223.3 million in FY24, and that would all be allocated to MCPS. Um, that question will be taken up at the full council, but obviously is tied to the question of what we recommend from this committee that should be funded, uh, just so you, we understand those two things. Um, we have a lot to cover, so just wanted to lay that out, uh, but I'm excited to begin and thank all of our staff and committee members. Uh, the way we'll structure the sessions, we're going to have a presentation from President Silvestri, Dr. McKnight and her team that's, I'm told, is brief. We, I know it's brief. I know it's 10 to 15 minutes max. Then we will turn it over to staff, uh, Ms. McGuire, to go through the various sections. And to colleagues, we will stop at every major heading and some of the subheadings within the packet 
to allow for questions as we go along. And I think that would be the, the best way. So we have uh, until 4.30, and, and we'll take as many questions and stay as long as we need to in that time to get them answered. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to President Silvestri from the board. Good afternoon, Chair Jalanza and members of the committee. We greatly appreciate this opportunity to begin this very important discussion. As you know, MCPS serves 162,000 kids from Silver Spring to Rockville to Clarksburg. It's a beautiful and large and complex system. Schools continue to prepare our future workforce, taxpayers, citizens, and leaders. They continue to offer a path out of poverty for many. They're places where community exists gathering families of all backgrounds around the education and well-being of children. Our schools are doing more for our students today than ever before. Students, schools feed children two or three meals a day. The youth mental health crisis that existed before the pandemic has gotten even worse, requiring expanded services. And 43% of our students today are children living in poverty with unique challenges and also full of promise and potential. The expectation remains that we provide an excellent and equitable education to all students across the county. Yet inflation adjusted per pupil funding has remained flat for nearly a decade while the needs have greatly increased. Now is the time to catch up to today's reality. As we enter the last few weeks of this school year, our first truly normal year after the pandemic, Montgomery County Public Schools is well positioned to show improvements after the pandemic. Academic trends are stabilizing and showing improvement. We are closely monitoring this progress. The board worked over a few months with the superintendent to generate the budget request before you today. Our budget is a three-legged stool, as you will hear about today. Student enrollment and inflation, number one. Compensation for our staff, number two and the academic accelerators based on what our students need at this time, number three. These accelerators are not nice to haves, but rather critical services like math coaches to support teaching and learning in schools, 40 ESOL teachers to meet the needs of our emergent multilingual learners, blueprint requirements like paying for APIB exam costs and dual enrollment fees, a Literacy and Math Professional Development Institute for our educators, 10 security assistants for our schools. I could go on, but you get the picture. The accelerators are also necessary <coughs> investments. The Board of Education's goal is success for all students, so they are prepared for college, career, and community. The board's, the board's purpose is oversight and accountability, and the board is committed to ensuring just that, oversight and accountability. Our commitment to you, our elected officials, our families, and our community at large is to ensure that these investments reap the results we expect and that our students deserve. Accountability and transparency are demonstrated in a number of ways. For example, the board has asked the superintendent for program evaluation to demonstrate what programs are working and which are not working so that we might discontinue them and focus on what works. At your second committee meeting, you will hear about the rollout of our program evaluation for key levers like summer school, tutoring, reading specialists, and more. That's transparency. Another accountability measure with such a large and complex system is for our stakeholders to understand our budget, where the funding is being invested. The board has asked the superintendent for a program budget, where you will see the investment to support key programs in MCPS organized by key initiatives. This is coming out later this year. Another accountability measure of the board is progress monitoring. Our North Star is to prepare students to be college, career, and community ready in order to know that we are headed in the right direction with our major academic outcomes. The board must do progress monitoring. What are the key levers that will get us the outcomes that we need? And how well is the implementation of these key levers going? If the implementation of the key levers is going well, then we know that we will see gains. We will monitor both implementation and impact. There is work to be done in communicating to the public these accountability measures of what is being done that will yield the positive outcomes we want and our students deserve. 
We look forward to working with this committee on these and other accountability measures so that we are being transparent to our community on how their investment in our schools is being spent. To close out my comments, this county has a long tradition of supporting our public school system as a central to our identity as a community. We must continue this proud tradition of support because our children depend on it. Thank you. Thank you, President Sylvester. Uh, Dr. McKnight. Thank you so much and good afternoon, uh, uh, Education Culture Committee Chair Jawando, Council Member Albanos, and Council Member Mink. I am thrilled that we are here today to have this conversation. As you mentioned, uh, Council Member Jawando, the discussion about the school system and the budget is one that has probably been the most discussed topic of our community since the board released its budget to the county and then the county executive released his budget of funding. And so today we are going to be as efficient as possible, but I do believe it is worth bearing uh, moments to truly understand what is happening in the school system. Our residents are asking, they deserve to understand the answer, and we'll take uh, a few moments to just unpack much of that so that some of those questions can be answered. And we also have a few moments to clarify just some of the conversation that we've been hearing that could clear up some confusion for our residents. And I do believe they deserve that opportunity. So looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, uh, President Silvestri, for just highlighting those points. Um, as you speak about accountability, that will be a theme that we discuss in our Education and Culture Committee meetings moving forward in the next three sessions. And looking forward to continuing that theme in the conversation with Council. So I'm going to begin by just talking about some celebrations. Lots of discussion about what is happening within our school system. And the last two and a half years have been the most difficult time for Montgomery County Public Schools and any school system within the nation. But I do believe that it is important for us to step back and think about this being a year that we are all grateful for. Children are in school. They are learning and we have the promise of consistency for them. And there have been some great things happening. Lots of things to do, and I'm gonna to get to that in a moment, but I think it's important to highlight some of the successes of our school system. And I'll start to name just a few. We've had 4,915 students receive over $300 million in scholarships this last year. That is significant. We have 241 students who were named National Merit Finalists. We have more than 16,000 students who are enrolled in career and technical programs. And MCPS is home to 43 National Blue Ribbon Schools, 43. So there are many great things happening in our school system and I contribute that success to our staff, our students, and our families because what I know is that these are not successes that the school system can achieve on its own and for that I am grateful. In our meeting, our next meeting, which will come quickly next week, we're going to talk a lot about some other components of the school system, mathematics and literacy specifically. We know that those are the foundational skills that students need to thrive and to be able to go into the workforce, to go into college and other spaces. And this budget absolutely supports the overall academic initiatives that will allow every student to be able to achieve that in Montgomery County Public Schools. But today, we will foreshadow that following the pandemic, students are, despite some of the challenges, are beginning to gain some ground academically. And I'm excited about that. This year, we were astute to make sure that we were looking at how students were doing at the beginning of this year, how they were doing mid-year, and we'll follow up with how they're doing at the end of the year because we expected to see a turn because they are returning to in-person. And a part of that accountability also means that we need a outward facing system for the public that speaks to our students' progression in those areas. And so today, we're going to share a quick preview of our pathway for college career and community readiness. We've been working on this model for over, well, actually almost a year knowing that we would be able to share it in the spring. 
And this is going to serve as a front-facing public accountability model because we actually want our entire community to know how are our students progressing on the academic milestones. And I look forward to working with you continuing in the future to be able to show that consistently throughout the year so that we have no questions in that space. And while we talk about accountability, I think it's important to say that our real business in education is student success. That's the product of our work, which in turn is success for our community here in Montgomery County. And so student success is how we then provide the services that we're supposed to provide to our county. And as we think about that, and we look at our numbers and our, stu our students coming back into school, we're seeing that the promise of that education is delivering in our enrollment. And I can't wait to share those numbers with you as we get more into the presentation. But I'm going to point to the slide that uh, you'll see that's posted. Um, and as we talk about areas of, of positive work happening in the school system, coming out of the pandemic, there were some areas that we really struggled through. The exciting thing about this slide is that it points out some of the major pain points that we struggled through during the pandemic. And not only did we get to a better part, Montgomery County Public Schools have received local and national accolades about some of those improvements. And I just want to name a few. The first being that our mid-year data this year showed that our students were gaining academically. That's what our local news was able to say when we were able to share our data at our mid-year point. We also, with significant effort and focus, were able to begin this school year 99% staff. Now, while we all will always want to be at 100, given the issues that we had around labor this past year, we were one of few systems nationally that were able to achieve that. And yes, with enrollment, that number moves. But our school system, our county, was hosted on Good Morning America to talk about that. And I contributed that success in a very, very honorable way to our community. I said to everyone who listened on that day, we've only been able to achieve this through the support of our community, those who came back and filled those vacancies and volunteered at our schools to help us get there. To that, I'll also mention our electrified bus fleet. It is currently the largest in the nation. The largest in the nation. And not only does that benefit us, but it also benefits our county climate goal. So MCPS is contributing there. We're also getting state-of-the-art tools to our teachers. And why are we doing that? Because we want to increase engagement for our students. We hosted an event this year, a technology showcase, in which we had staff lined up outside the door to come in and preview state-of-the-art technology, VR headsets, to take students to the Amazon while they are sitting in their classroom seats. That's the kind of education that the children today need. And we've done amazing work with food and nutrition. During the pandemic, we got lots of feedback about food and nutrition not being one that provided a responsive choice menu of students to honor ethnicity, culture, religion, all of those pieces. And so imagine the pride I felt, you should have felt, when NBC4 anchors did a taste test of the menu development in MCPS as a result of that. That meant we heard the challenges and we did everything in our power to deliver. And as we deliver, we know that it doesn't always work out all the kinks. But what I'll promise to you is a commitment from us, the school system, our Board of Education, to be astute to continue to address those areas that are areas of concern or areas that our community shared with us we need to focus on. So I've talked about some of the accolades. We have a lot more to do, a lot more. You have been with me and you have seen the difference in an entire community which a school is a part of after this pandemic. People were faced with realities that they didn't anticipate, they did not expect, and many of them were changed forever. I read an article that talked about students after the pandemic experienced more loss than students had ever received over a century. 
That changes the mindset, the heart, the experiences of a kindergartner to a 12th grader. And they're coming into our schools and we have to meet their needs. That's where we are today. That's the reality that we're living. Our board president pointed out the needs that we're facing in the school system are great. They're great for our students, they're great for our staff. And some might even look at the needs and say, you know what, they're overwhelming. And just to name a couple of examples, our families and students have not escaped this public health and safety issue without having the issues that result from that. Opioid use, including, including fentanyl, which we rallied together across agency and said, what do we all need to do to make sure we address this issue that's not just impacting our students, but our community? To name another challenge, we've had an alarming rise of hate incidents across this county and in our schools, which demanded that we have a strategic focus. And we did that. And we will continue to do it, as we know we must. So I think as school and county leaders, we have this responsibility that says we have a lot to do and it's going to be hard and we're going to have to have many hard discussions and make really difficult decisions. But what we are accountable for as leaders is that we must take action and we have to take action in the moment that requires our attention in the way that it needs it right now. Some of the challenges that I, talk, challenges that I talked about as I stated earlier, they're not unique challenges to Montgomery County. We're not in this alone. Um, and as I think about that, I've been doing a lot of reading, trying to figure out what's happening across the nation. Because quite frankly, what's, what's happening in education it isn't just in this bubble. And so I'm out seeking information. Um, I read an article from Harvard's Graduate School of Education that really told a really good story about the research from school systems across the nation needed to be elevated because we're all struggling with the same issues after the pandemic. And the research showed how deeply the pandemic affected schools and student learning. And here's what it noted, noted, that there needed to be significant infusions of federal government dollars into schools and how that is crucial for recovery. And it is now time for localities across the nation to step up and look at new ways to fund and target instruction. Those are not my words. Those words came from the Harvard Review as it spoke about the need of public education across the nation. And then our Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardono, in the same article, he quoted, or I'm gonna quote him, he said, we must muster the political will at the state and local level, level to match the urgency and in federal investment in our students through the historic $122 billion in the American Rescue Plan. Not my words, but I saw that as a call to action. The Board of Education saw that as a call to action, and we responded by presenting how we could begin to address the needs in our public school system. And so to confront that reality, I can tell you that the investments that were proposed by this Board of Education in the system really get at that need. The next slide, please. Um, I just want to quickly state to you um, some necessary investments in this budget. We're often asked the question, what can we do without? That's a hard question when you think about children. When I think about my son and anybody in this room who has any children, and when you're left with the question every day, what can your child do without today? Your answer is going to be, I want them to have it all. I want them to have the food that they need and deserve. I want them to have the quality of education. I want them to have caring adults around them every day. I want them to be safe. We want all of that. And it is our responsibility to think about how we're going to deliver that for over 161,000 students who have some parents who can advocate for that and know how to do it and others who can't. And so I just want to take a moment to talk about those key investments. President Silvestri mentioned that three-legged stool. That's exactly how I look at this, a three-legged stool. And we know if we remove that leg, one leg from the three, that stool is not going to stand. And for me, it's the student that's sitting on that stool, for all of us. 
And so first I'll say the school system has to catch up. And here we are right now as leaders, right? I'm in my first year as the superintendent of schools after a pandemic, but I'm here and I'm proud to be here. Couldn't be here in one of the most challenging times. And I love this community so much that when people ask me, wow, what made you want to do this? <laughs> and I say to them, because in Montgomery County, if it can't be done here, it can't be done anywhere. And people care about children's education in this county. And so here we are, didn't choose it, but we're at a time in which we have to catch up. And it's not catching up from yesterday. It's not catching up from a year ago. It's not catching up from two years ago. It's catching up from over a decade ago, an entire decade. And let's think about what's happened over that decade. We're serving more students in poverty than we ever have. We're serving more international students who come to this country looking for opportunity. They're the fastest growing student population in this county. They deserve a world-class education, just like the student who's been here and was born in Montgomery County and have been here from birth and should receive that education. And we have to catch up for all of those students, regardless of their profile or experience. Second, we're struggling to recruit and retain staff. We are the largest school system in the state of Maryland. Basic level, we have to hire more staff, more bus drivers, more teachers, more building service workers, more cafeteria staff. Every, we have to hire more. And not only do we have to hire them, we have to work with them to have them want to stay here. And that means they need to be able to be here, be a part of this community. And quite frankly, when you think about the staff, they're the most important ingredient to student success. They're the most important ingredient, and we can't do it without them. And third, when we think about the budget enhancements, and we think about our accelerators, we're going to talk about that in just a moment, but I want to say mathematics nationally has taken a hit during the pandemic. When you think about it, children need mathematics every single day. They, they need math all the time, and it's repetitive, and they have to build on it. That's why we see a national decline in mathematics. But we have to move that in Montgomery County Public Schools, just like everybody else. And so we have put an accelerator in to have key staff in schools working to improve teaching and to monitor results. We have more teachers designated for English language learners. I told you, fastest growing population in Montgomery County Public Schools. We have students going into more dual enrollment programs, which we should right there at Montgomery College. Many of them then moving on to USG. We've also put in investments paying for IP, IB and AP courses for students, which I'll say when I think about the racial equity and social justice impact that our county so proudly put into place, one of the biggest ways to actually improve the opportunity gap. Students will go into those programs when they know they don't have to worry about the fiscal, the, the fiscal note that goes along with it if they already know and aware of the hardships of their families. And then we have to create different types of schools as well. So we have accelerators in there to actually plan for two-way immersion and more innovative calendar schools where students are in school for a longer period of time. We have to move from a model of one size fits all in Montgomery County to differentiation for what students and communities need. And finally, this budget also invests in students' mental health, physical health, and safety. So I name those investments because then I'm left with often being asked the question, what can we do without? When I look at those investments, I have a hard time figuring out what it is that we can do without. When I look at the promise of students, those second graders I sat with at Twinbrook Elementary yesterday, they deserve all of this. And you see them too. You're in our schools. You're aware of these challenges. And so as I think about that, I just want to close with great schools are the economic engine of every community. Economic engine. And that's no different right here in Montgomery County. And so as we continue to think about 
What do we need to catch up? What do we need to accelerate? What do we need to do to support? I look forward to us having those lengthy and detailed discussions about that because I do want our community to fully understand all the components of what this budget is requesting. And I appreciate your time and attention for giving us the opportunity, the time over the next month or so to do just that. Now I'm going to ask Mr. Hall, our Chief Operating Officer, to just give a few points on some of the investments and some background information um, that I think is really important. We intentionally planned this presentation to address some of the questions that have come up in our community around, I don't understand this. So we're going to move to that. Mr. Hall, I'll turn it over to you. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Superintendent McKnight. Uh, members of the Education and Culture Committee, I'm Brian Hall, the Chief Operating Officer for MCPS. Mr. Hall, I would just ask that this is a little longer than I thought. The, right, the remarks were right on, and I appreciate them, but just if you could move expeditiously through these slides. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Yep. So um, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, I'm here, we're here today to answer the question, why are we asking for $296 million, 230 of which are, are, are dollars being requested from the county. So this is the stool. Um, the three components of our budget request are pretty simple and straightforward. Um, we are very excited to be growing in enrollment, and we look forward to welcoming over 2,000 new students next year. The $45.5 million that you can see on the slide here is what is required to provide the same services next year uh, that we're providing this year. We call it our same services budget. So with the growing enrollment and the inflationary costs, this is what's needed just to maintain the services that we're providing today. The second and by far the largest piece comprising over two thirds of the total budget request is the $203.5 million for employee compensation. We need every dollar of this money to meet the obligations that we are currently negotiating with our association partners and to simply meet the requirements of the blueprint for Maryland's future. Finally, the $47 million in accelerators are the key investments that are going to accelerate student learning, help close the opportunity gap, enhance safety, and equip the district to be competitive in the current landscape of education in the state of Maryland. Without any one of these components or any leg of the stool, what happens to the student? It's something none of us would want to see. Or to the hundreds or, or to the thousands of students who remain in a very fragile recovery from what has been the greatest disruption to public education in history. Next slide, please. There are seven themes that I will just briefly touch on, and I will move expeditiously. Um, first, every dollar in our budget is allocated and spent. It is important to note that funding, the funding that MCPS receives, whether from the county, the state, or the federal government, are fully allocated. MCPS leaves nothing on the table. And we continue to identify reductions and reallocations as part of our annual budget process. Our FY22 $87 million. But this should not be misinterpreted to understand to think that we leave funds on the table. That number, the 87 million, includes $6 million in non-spendable inventory, $16 million in funds set aside for school-based activities, the school-based activity funds, another $23 million of encumbrances, which are simply purchase orders, commitments that go into the next fiscal year. So after accounting for those three buckets and the $35 million that the County Council required us to hold aside from FY22 to fund the FY23 budget, we spent 99.7% of our operating budget. I think that bears repeating. Last year, we spent 99.7% of our operating budget. Next slide, please. So this slide shows uh, the ESSER funds that the district has received as part of the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, commonly referred to as ESSER. We have already expended all $24.8 million of ESSER 1 that expired this past September. For ESSER 2, we received $112 million. $87 million has been spent, leaving approximately $14 million to be spent by this September of 2023. For ESSER 3, we received $252 million and have spent about half, 
leaving a little over 50% to be spent by September 30th of 2024. Our students are relying on the remaining ESSER II and remaining ESSER III funds for critical recovery services like summer school, tutoring, technology, mental health, and professional development for teachers. In your packets on pages 9 and 10, you have the detailed budget for all remaining ESSER funds. If we could go to the next slide, please. So, uh, theme two, we are transparent and accountable. Each fiscal year after schools open, we submit a detailed monthly financial report to the Board of Education, the County Executive, and the County Council, as well as year-end expenditure projections. At the close of the fiscal year, we request categorical transfers when necessary to the Board, Council, and County Executive. Each year, in addition to the Board of Education's internal audit team, the regular MSDE audits of MCPS, an, an independent auditor examines all MCPS finances and issues an expert opinion. For the past 41 years, MCPS has received a Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting from the Association of School Business Officials. And for the past 18 years, similar recognition from the Government Finance Officers Association, which is seen broadly as the standard bearer for government accounting practices across the country. Next slide, please. The vast majority of our resources are directed to our 211 schools. Approximately 80% of the MCPS budget goes directly to schools, while the remaining amounts provide direct services such as transportation, facility operations, maintenance, food service, information technology, just to name a few. In fact, based on state reporting categories, only 2% of our budget goes to central administration, and this is one of the lowest amounts of any school district in the state of Maryland. Next slide, please. Theme four, we seek to save before we seek to spend. As we prepare the MCPS budget, existing programs and operations are reviewed for potential savings and realignments to better serve the students more efficiently. This year, the process also included finding reductions in individual office budgets, resulting in repurposing or eliminating of funds. Reductions were realized in the areas shown on the screen. Now, our Deputy Superintendent, Dr. Pat Murphy, will talk very briefly about our program monitoring process and our new student pathways. Thank you, Mr. Hall, and good afternoon, uh, Educational and Culture Committee. I'm just going to just highlight some aspects of some of the existing systems we have in place for accountability, but also some of the ways we've either upgraded or improved. We've always had a formal evaluation system where we've evaluated programs or different activities in the district, but we've moved forward with that to be a little bit more definitive in looking about how we make decisions about programs, what financial allocations we have, and maybe decisions that we want to either adjust or discontinue programs. Connected with that, we also have implemented a new program monitoring system that we'll talk a little bit more with you about next week. I will make note tomorrow the school board at their school board uh, meeting is going to hear about both the accountability system and the um, pathway document. So you may want to tune in or you may want to uh, capture some of that. Please go to the next slide. Another part of our accountability system is directly connected to student learning. And this is noted here with um, what Dr. McKnight mentioned with the pathway to college and career readiness. This model was, model was developed to show our school system's progress on student learning and development of competencies. The Office of Shared Accountability will continue to work with other offices and schools to monitor the, and support the implementation of this plan. Student academic performance will always be the priority. Our work is to identify, implement, and evaluate, and adjust so that every child will be successful. Um, I made note of the school board meeting tomorrow, so please tune in. But next week when we come back, we're going to talk with you in more detail about both of these slides. All right. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. So if we could go to the next slide, the seventh and final theme is our growing enrollment, which uh, the superintendent touched on. 
So after two years of enrollment declines during the pandemic uh, that affected districts across the country, I think virtually every district uh, experienced similar uh, enrollment losses during the pandemic. But unlike many, many other districts, we have actually seen our enrollment rebound significantly um, this past year. And while eight of the 24 LEAs in the state experienced enrollment decreases in the 22-23 school year, MCPS had the second largest K-12 enrollment increase in the state. Projections by our demographer, as shown on the screen, show MCPS continuing to grow in enrollment at least through the end of the decade. Next slide, please. And might I add, we've already exceeded that projection number as of today. Just to be clear, our student enrollment as of uh, actually April 18th is 162,616. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. So this graph shows MC MCPS per pupil funding going back to the beginning of the century. The top blue line shows actual per pupil funding during this time period, while the second line shows the same per pupil data adjusted for inflation. As we are all aware in the current environment, it is the inflation-adjusted funding that gives an accurate picture of the district's purchasing power over time. As you can see, MCPS funding has not kept up with inflation, and we are in fact funded at a lower per pupil rate today than we were in 2009 and 2010. This directly impacts the salaries we are able to offer and the services we are able to provide the students of Montgomery County. Next slide, please. MCPS is being asked to do more with less. Over the past 13 years, MCPS's share of the Montgomery County operating budget has declined from 53% of the operating budget in 2010 to 49% in 2023. This four percentage point gap equates to approximately $230 million per year. During the same time period, we have seen a 50% increase in our students for whom English is not their first language. Nearly the same level of increase in students who qualify for free and reduced price lunches. And a significant increase in students qualifying for special education services. Now I do wanna acknowledge that the county does provide additional supports to schools beyond just the operating budget, such as nurses and capital funding. At the same time, the share of the operating budget that goes to schools has decreased slightly. Demand on the system has increased significantly due to higher enrollment, the COVID-19 pandemic, the blueprint for Maryland's future, and significant inflationary pressures. MCPS's current starting teacher salary is $54,038 per year, ranking us fifth in the state for teachers with a bachelor's degree. With all of Maryland's LEAs mandated to reach a starting salary of $60,000 per year by 2025, what we are requesting in this budget represents a significant down payment on that investment. This budget will increase our starting teacher salary to just over $57,000 per year, setting us up to achieve the blueprint requirement on time, but just barely. Our hardworking administrators and support staff are in need of commensurate increases to remain competitive in the current labor market. We are only eighth in the state for salaries for our most experienced principals and administrators. Next slide, please. As the superintendent noted, these uh, additional demands are not unique to Montgomery County. As the article from the Harvard Education Policy St uh, Center states, the need is for the whole community to hear the alarm bells ringing, not just schools. And while many are happy to get back to normal after COVID, normal will not help kids catch up. This slide shows the budget requests of the other large school districts in Maryland. And please note that while Prince George's County is requesting only 3.6% increase for next year, that is in part because they already received a 12.2% increase prior to this current school year. So we are very much in the middle of the pack as far as what we are requesting to meet the needs of this moment. 
From its inception, the blueprint was designed to increase education funding over the next 10 years, enrich student experiences, and accelerate student outcomes, as well as improve quality education, especially for those historically underserved. The blueprint was designed so that local governments, over time, would pick up a greater share of the blueprint costs. An estimate generated by the Department of Legislative Services soon after the blueprint was signed into law shows that Montgomery County's contribution to implementing the blueprint would increase from $1.6 billion in 2024 to $2.4 billion in 2034. There are several areas where local funding is required to supplement state blueprint funding, including teacher salaries, National Board Certified Teacher Bonuses, post-secondary IB and AP exam fees, the expansion of our pre-K program, the expansion of career and technical education, and our community schools. So in conclusion, this budget request represents the extraordinary needs of the students and educators in Montgomery County in this unprecedented time. Thank you, and we look forward to addressing your questions. Thank you, Mr. Hall, and thank you, Dr. McKnight and President Silvestri, and to Dr. Murphy and the whole team. Um, so now, as I said at the beginning, what we're going to do is turn it to Ms. McGuire and staff to go through the packet, and we will uh, ask colleagues just to tap me and or point at me, and then we will stop at the end of each subheading of note. There may be some we collapse and take questions, and uh, and obviously, if anyone wants to speak, just please let us know. You want to say something now? Okay. And before we go to Ms. McGuire, I'm going to ask uh, Councilman Robinson. Thanks. Uh, it's obviously a lot to process, and clearly we're at a crossroads. Clearly, we all feel the weight of what's on the line. We all know and have experienced what have happened these last three years in particular. Um, I'm very proud of the way the school system has stepped up and been innovative during an extraordinarily difficult circumstances that none of us could have anticipated. Um, but I think this packet lays out well where we need to go over the next three sessions, but more importantly, well beyond that. Um, and that is, where are we, what is working and not working, and where do we go from here? Um, I do want to take issue with something that you said. The, the, there's a lot more support provided to our children, youth, and families beyond the school system's budget than just nurses and capital funding, which are critical. Our out-of-school time programs, the investments that we make through the county's Department of Health and Human Services, the food and the nutritional needs of our families, there are many different ways in which we support our families. And when we talk about accountability, everybody around this table is accountable. We, of course, are accountable to the children, youth, and families who are participating in what I think is the best school system in the country, and we want it to keep it that way. But we also have to acknowledge that there are many other needs that go beyond the school system's ability to address. And so we as council members have to look at this budget holistically and as a whole. And we also have to think about the future and what's on the horizon and ensure that we be responsible and fiscally responsible so that we don't create problems that we will not be able to solve later. There's no question that there is unprecedented deed now. And there's no question that we have to meet this moment. But we have to do it in collaboration and in partnership. And there will be at least two joint sessions, as there often, as there always are, between education and culture and HHS um, in order to address those needs. But I look forward to um, the ongoing discussion. And accountability means different things to different people. It depends on where you are. It depends on your position. Uh, it depends on whether you have a child in the school system, whether you work for the school system. And so we have to look at it through a variety of different lenses. And we will certainly do so, not just through these next few sessions, but beyond that. We have to think creatively um, so that we as policymakers can be in a better position moving forward, whether it be the council or the board or the administration of the superintendent, um, to be able to do right by our families, which is important. But the other lens that I'm going to be looking through as we go through this budget process is how exactly this impacts the teacher in the classroom. How exactly this impacts the school administrators in the schools. Because we have these wonderful programs, these wonderful initiatives, this wonderful construct, and we've been innovative for generations now within our school system. But 
how will that specifically translate? And because this is more than just a money issue. Um, this is an issue of respect. This is an issue of support. This is an issue that goes beyond just dollars and cents. And so uh, I do look forward to all of the conversations that we're going to be having. Uh, it's an impressive initial presentation, as it always is. Um, and I look forward to digging in, especially in the second session, uh, when we talk about some of the individual programs. Thank you, Councilman Robertas. Um, Ms. McGuire, let's keep going. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, and today's uh, work session and the material presented here really does provide sort of just the, the fiscal overview um, and we'll dive deep into some of the fiscal and structural elements of the budget so that the committee again can talk through uh, a number of the revenue and expenditure issues at the macro level. Um, and then as you've noticed, certainly as we go into the subsequent work sessions, um, dive a little more into some of the programmatic elements and other pieces that were raised today. Um, I'll just briefly, beginning on the bottom of page three of your packet, note a couple of those macro numbers. The board's total request for FY24 is $3.2 billion. That's an increase of $296 million or 10% from all funding sources. Um, we often also look at the tax supported budget, which excludes specific grants and also the enterprise funds. Uh, that is also a 10% increase of $289 million. The board's request would increase the local contribution by 230.7 million. Uh, that is actually um, uh, over, I'm sorry, the 230.7 million is over the FY23 local contribution from last year. And as you mentioned, that same services, at least, it's not really same services, but the same funding level from FY23 last year is sort of our beginning marker, particularly in this year. Um, maintenance of effort would actually be a decrease. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment, but um, that uh, the, the board's request is higher over MOE again because it is a decrease this year, which is certainly unusual. The board does project increasing enrollment, as was highlighted. Uh, the numbers you saw earlier include uh, pre-kindergarten and certainly um, uh, the most recent numbers. As we know, enrollment does fluctuate throughout the year. Um, but the board's projected FY24 enrollment, uh, as presented in the, in the budget document, is 157,469 students in grade in grades K-12, to which is 1,600 students more than the current uh, school year enrollment that was captured in September. So again, we really, again, as you saw in the graph, are seeing that increase, um, uh, again, from the sort of low point that was reached um, slightly after the pandemic. Uh, your packet separates the three-legged stool into four, uh, but, the, but they are the same legs. Uh, the salaries and benefits is 203 uh, million, as you saw, 69% of the requested increase. The accelerators at 47 million are 16% of the requested increase. Uh, and I just separated out inflation and rate changes at 24 million or 8% of the increase. And then enrollment in new space is 21 million or 7% of the increase. We'll dive more into the accelerators both in this packet and in the future. Um, the board's budget does add a total of 539 FTE. Uh, and of that total, the majority of them, 382 FTE, are added in the categories of teacher and of instructional support. Um, just briefly, the county executive's recommendation uh, is, is slightly lower. It's 99.8% of the board's request. Um, the county executive's recommended county contribution is $223 million. That is $7.5 million less than the board requested. And as we've discussed briefly, um, we do take note of some of the additional dollars that are appropriated in other areas of the county uh, budget that don't, that certainly speak directly to MCPS but do not uh, appear in the school system's budget. Debt service uh, on school construction bonds is one of the largest components of that in the operating budget. That's $150 million. Um, we also do contribute to uh, the pre-funding of retiree health benefits on behalf of the school system at $62 million. We've captured about $125 million of support services here, and as uh, Mr. Albernos was saying, the ones we capture here we try to limit to those that are directly in the schools or directly 
in support of the schools, certainly um, support of families goes much beyond that. And then, of course, our technology modernization dollars, which are a significant portion of the technology budget, are in the capital budget and don't appear in the operating appropriation. So those are just some of the pieces that we track there, um, in addition to some of the other supports that have been mentioned. And I'll pause there before I dive into maintenance of effort. Um, any comments on any of those buckets from colleagues or any comments from the school system? Let me start with colleagues first. Anything on that? Okay. Anything you want to say? All right. Let's keep going. Very briefly on maintenance of effort, as I mentioned, it is a decrease this year, which is unusual. Um, I will spare all of us the puts and takes of MOE for the past few years because it has changed, I think, every five minutes uh, since about 2020. Um, and the, there is a very good summary uh, that my former colleague did last year of all of those puts and takes, if anyone wants to read it. But suffice it to say that at this point, the legislature appears to have taken an action that would allow counties to sort of try to reset where they think their post-pandemic level is. Uh, and so so they have um, essentially legislated that counties can sort of take out some of the additional dollars that were required to hold harmless school systems during that tenuous time of the pandemic. As a result, uh, it is possible that it would be decreased. Again, um, I think our, our affordability marker that we're talking about is really from last year. Um, but just again, as a, as a point of comparison, that is there. I do want to note that at the bottom of page five of your packet, um, we did calculate that the FY24 maintenance of effort calculation under this um, legislative assumption would be 11,465. The executives recommended uh, increase would increase the per pupil amount to 13,261,000 uh, going forward. Um, and again, certainly that uh, is multiplied across uh, enrollment going forward. Maintenance of effort captures only new local dollars. It does not take any other funding sources into account. And I can just say pretty definitively that we won't be going with maintenance of effort this year. So, but since we're using 23 as the base. Okay. Uh, on the top of page six, uh, we want to talk about some of the revenues that support. There is a table, again, there that shows the um, relative proportions of the major um, revenue sources that go into the MCPS budget. The board's requested county contribution total of just over $2 billion represents 64.4% of the total request. Um, that is consistent, really, with where we've been, a little bit on the higher side proportionally, but essentially we range between 63 64%. Um, and have for quite some time. Um, Montgomery County does contribute one of the highest proportions of local dollars um, to this public schools in the state, uh, uh, second only, I believe, to Worcester County. I have a table in here, again, in the middle of page six, that shows the history of our actual local contribution amounts over maintenance of effort. Just went back to FY18. You'll see that in most of the comparison points here, I sort of took 18 as a pre-pandemic snapshot uh, because certainly, again, we all know that the intervening years uh, are complicated to say the least. Um, nonetheless, you would see that certainly the last two years, last year FY23 and the potential request for this year um, are um, much larger over amounts over maintenance of effort than had been um, in that most recent pre-pandemic experience. Okay. Yeah, uh, so I think we'll pause for here for one second. I do want to have a little discussion here. I think to the casual observer here, you look at these numbers, and obviously last year, 86 million over MOE. Um, the proposed recommended here, 264 million. Obviously, we've talked about in great detail so far just why we think you, the school system and why we all understand uh, these investments are necessary. I just want to allow you, Dr. McKnight, and team to put this in context of what does that mean? You know, obviously we have these needs for this year. What do you see on the horizon um, as you go forward? Because I think that's understandably some in the community have said, well, okay, we do, we do this. What does that mean for the year after or the year after that? And as far as what is going to be asked of, of the residents and of the county to uh, contribute? Absolutely. Um, I must say, um, it's so interesting when we think about that question because it's a fair one and a good one because for the last two years we've had to really put it in the context of unprecedented times. However, I'm going to say now we're at a much better point of being able to predict what to expect in the future. One, because 
the operational needs around management of COVID-19 certainly don't exist in that way. So we're able to better do that. And I'll point out a few areas that we are astutely focusing on and doing many projections. My goal is that we're able to share with our council overall, even before you make a final decision around what some of those areas are um, in advance so that we can better know where we're going in the future. And I'll tell you the areas specifically. Blueprint. There are blueprint requirements that we're expected to meet over the last few years. Of course, we spent some time today talking about the base of teacher salary. Um, and so we know we need to get there. So we're able to project out in that area and many other areas. The 100% we're required to pay for students who are in dual enrollment programs. We can, we can project out what some of those costs will be associated with the blueprint that will help us. Um, so, so that's one area. The, the other area that I'll mention that we're able to um, better project out would be, um, of course, beyond uh, the, the blueprint, let's think about what are the areas that we're going to continue to innovate in the classroom. We can predict what some of those are. This year's budget, we've actually switched up some of the, one, some of the uh, accelerators that we initially put in place for implementation and switched them to planning dollars. So for example, the two models that I mentioned earlier, increasing our dual language schools and our innovative calendar schools, those are models that we found success in despite COVID um, in their implementation. And ones that we also desire to be able to expand given the need in our community within Montgomery County. But we wanted to plan more intentionally so we can, since we already have those programs in place, we can project what the cost, what the cost will be for full implementation and can, be, can better share that with the council so that you are able to, um, to share that information. Um, those are the two areas that come to mind. We were actually just discussing this earlier today. I'll ask Dr. Murphy and Mr. Hall, am I missing any other area that we talked about specifically that we would be able to project out? So I think we have to factor in that uh, the ESSER funding is yes. going to be expiring. And so that's uh, part of that picture that we've got to build into that projection. The other, and you saw this plane itself out, was around enrollment. And it's very clear that students are returning to public school, which is a positive indicator for all of us. But as you can see, the, the increase from the start of the school year to where we are today is well over 2,000 students, and we're not even done with the school year. So we've got to factor those elements into the picture. And then I think the last element is looking at um, continuing to meet the blueprint objectives specifically focused around compensation and how that is going to play out and making sure that we have a strong workforce in our classrooms and supporting our classrooms uh, with, throughout the district. And if I could just add Please. just a little detail to, to that, um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, our teacher's starting salary right now is $54,000 per year. Uh, this investment gets us halfway to the 60000 that we need uh, with two budget cycles remaining, so would put us in a place to be uh, requesting more what I would call traditional uh, raises. Um, in the two to three percent range, if we do not get this, uh, you know, increase for our uh, compensation, we're not going to have a choice based on the blueprint requirements, but to come back with a large ask uh, in one of the subsequent years. And one more piece, I'm so glad this is the full brain here because we have these conversations all the time and we help each other remember those components. ESSA was a big part of our discussion, so. We know we've had the luxury of having ESSER funds for the past three years, and that is going to be expiring. We also know many of those funds were helped to address needs that existed as a result of COVID-19 while we were trying to operate. Not all of them will be necessary to keep. As we talked about accountability earlier, a part of what we must do being fiscally accountable and responsible is to be able to go through and evaluate, well, as a result of the pandemic, what did we discover that we implemented that actually makes sense for us to continue in the future and continue with those investments? And many of the others may not be as significant, or I know some won't be as significant, and so those will be ones that we can easily send over the cliff because they're not compromising our work in any way. And we're not going to do that work alone. Councilmember Abernos, you talked about wanting to get into this pieces of what does this mean for the teacher in the classroom? What does this mean for the principal? What does it mean for our supporting services staff, boots on the ground? They've been with us the entire time in advocating for this entire budget. And that is because, 
as we think about what's needed, we know we can't do that in isolation. Now, I'm sitting here as superintendent, but I was also a teacher in the system, a principal in the system, and many other positions. And so as we think about what those investments are going to be, we're going to do that with our staff. They have been a part of this discussion. Our associations have been a part of our budget advisory, as well as many of our community um, stakeholders, some of whom are here today. And so as we go through and decide what's going to be important that have actually leveraged us success and how we define that is going to be a big part of what we bring to you and are able to show results in terms of here's what's going to be necessary to move forward and here is what won't. And so we're putting that into the context of this projection that we, you know, look to share with you and taking that into consideration. But, of course, the accountability of all of this will continue to be a consistent discussion. I appreciate that. And, and you know, the brain answering that question, the three of you, the three-legged stool that's before us plus, you know, plus uh, more. You know, when you talk about salaries and benefits, that's I had asked our staff to kind of calculate the percentage. It's almost 70 percent of the request is the salary and benefits this year. It's good to hear you say, and I just want to emphasize for folks watching that to meet the blueprint obligation, while that's a significant number of the requests this year, if we do this, that will not be, that level of increase will not be required in the next, in the next years. It would be more traditional 3%-ish kind of increase, which I think is important, which will take which, what is 70% of the request here down. And, and uh, so I think, you know, people need to hear that, that this is not, in addition to ESSER's, there, there, there's some puts and takes. ESSER is going to run out, so there's going to be some things that are you're using for ESSER dollars that will need to continue and that you're going to need to move over to the base budget. But then you're going to evaluate other things and discontinue them. So that's going to be an ongoing process that the board and, and this committee and all of us are going to need to be go, going through with you throughout the year. Uh, you know, as we always say, and Councilor Alvinas, who I'm going to turn to, set, knows from running the rec department, budgets, the next budget year starts on July 1, you know, so, or, or if not before. So uh, th that's helpful information. I'm going to turn to Council Member Alvinas and then Council Member Mink. Thank you. I appreciate that because I, I know it was mentioned that the, as a general percentage of the overall operating budget, it's gone down. But um, I know Council Member Jawanda and I are particularly proud that over the last four fiscal years, the four budgets that he and I had an opportunity to be a part of, we consistently went over maintenance of effort in every one of those and in one year at what was then a historical increase. So we're willing to do what's necessary. There's, there's no question about that. Um, it's just a question of is this the right way to do it? Um, and, and we're obviously going to be dig digging into that. But the whole maintenance of effort issue as a construct is something that is challenging, to say the least. Um, because when it was designed, it didn't take into an account all that we've experienced since its initial design. It was always intended to be the floor. Um, but the problem moving forward is if, God forbid, there's a recession and we have to make dramatic reductions to the county's overall operating budget, by the construct of maintenance of effort, it's, it's, it's all the other agencies that are going to get cut. It's libraries, it's recreation, it's health and human services. Um, and so we have to, it's hard to look ahead. Um, but I appreciate Chair Jawando's point, and I appreciate the responses. And there are a couple you didn't even mention. I mean, the, the national just disaster that is our immigration system uh, is leading to more families in need coming to Montgomery County, which we need to continue to be proud to receive, but put people who are serving those incredibly vulnerable families in the best position to serve them. And that's a growing need for sure. And our special needs community, uh, which was disproportionately impacted during the pandemic, more so than any other demographic. And that is directly impacting the teachers in the classroom's ability to be able to address those students' as needs. So there's a, lot, there's a lot of moving pieces here, but we are going to need to work with our state delegation moving forward to see how we can better work collaboratively with the state legislature. And we, we finally have a governor now. We haven't for eight years, but we do now, um, who very much understands and gets uh, the importance of the collaboration and partnership. But, you know, the, we're, we're going to have an intense month here. 
Um, but the, the subsequent follow-up will be just as, as important uh, to what the decisions we make today. And I, I can't imagine us going, you know, very much higher in future years. We just, our budget just won't be able to absorb it unless we grow our economic base, and that's going to take a long time. So it, it's, it, we're going to be here every year, um, but obviously this year in particular is very important. Thank you. Councilmember uh, Juwando, if I may, um, first, thank you so much, Councilmember Abanos, for what you just said. Um, I will say this year I'm very proud that we were able to work with the delegation a lot closer than we have in the past, and we have a lot more to do. And I agree with you 100 percent. Maintenance of effort, effort has to be at the top of the list. It's actually an example of a very old infrastructure that was probably established before any of us were even here. Um, much less than these seats, I mean physically here, born. Um, and here we are trying to work through a system that no longer meets the need. And I must say, the biggest, is biggest issue with MOE is that it considers uh, Montgomery County to be a monolith of wealth, which doesn't represent our entire community. And so I look forward to us being able to work together on that because the first part of this is changing up some legislation that causes some of the issues that we're trying to work through right now. And you said this earlier, and, and you're absolutely right. Montgomery County actually, we don't provide many of the services in isolation of others. I mean, you were the director of Parks and Rec. And I mean, and now all the work that you're doing, you've done with us over safety, the safety committee and all of those pieces, our work transcends across all of those agencies. Um, and so they are a part of the puzzle, and we acknowledge that and know that because we're able to offer a better menu of services when we work in partnership with them. And so I'm glad you brought that up. I think about Parks and Rec as we're, you know, again, being innovative, thinking about the out-of-school time initiation, I mean, uh, initiative um, to make sure that we're addressing several things. One, to provide our teachers with more flexibility with planning time, which is what they need, and to be able to provide more time for our uh, supporting services staff to get more professional development, which is what they're asking for. And so that means we're relying on all of our community partners to actually host our students and our businesses and others on those days. And so I, I do understand that. And that, so as we project out, um, honestly, the, the impact of all of the programs over the year, because as you said, Councilmember Jawando, the next budget starts right after this one is approved. So I look forward to our Education and Culture Committee meetings in the future, actually allowing us the time to start early now that we've had a couple of years of data of some of these uh, innovative programs that we've had that have been funded by ESSER. We can actually begin that conversation in our meetings to say, we've been looking at these programs. We've been evaluating the success of these programs. These are ones that we know we will not be moving forward to continue to fund. And here's how we, we, we've been able to do that. So not just having those conversations with the stakeholders that I mentioned earlier, but having the public conversation with you so that we are moving along to the next year. And, and I just want to say we recognize that this is a commitment of an entire community. And we are not in any way thinking selfishly about the school system. Our job is to, to, to be able to share what the true needs are so that, you know, you're able to make the decisions, but we recognize that we do not work in isolation. Appreciate that. Uh, and I want to just acknowledge uh, board member Lynn Harris uh, from the school board, who's a frequent attendee of the ENC committee. We're going to get her a badge. Um, mm -hmm. And and then uh, Jennifer Martin from uh, the MCEA and her team. Uh, to your point, Dr. McKnight, we can't do any of this without our partners, and uh, appreciate you all being here. Uh, Councilmember Mink. Thank you. <laughs> you don't have to lean in, pick you up. Okay. Um, yeah, this is a great conversation, and, and thank you all for really coming to this with us with such a spirit of uh, transparency and collegiality. Um, that's absolutely what we're going to need to get through these these tough times, and certainly uh, look forward to continuing to work together with this type of meaningful partnership with all of us here as we as we continue to move this work forward. Um, wanted to add additional context for uh, you know for the public who are again as as mentioned looking at this really big number. Um, um, and to note that we all here have talked about the importance of staffing and how that is fundamental, fundamental to every program that we want to implement needs 
qualified people to implement it. Um, so, you know, we have seen in some years, recent years, you know, little to no increases for staff, you know, in, in the recent past, um, you know, as, as we have all been struggling to figure out how do we, how do we make do with this budget. But, um, you know, at this point, we are seeing the results of that. Uh, we have, uh, we have people who are going to other jurisdictions, um, who are leaving the profession entirely. Um, and so as we talk about, you know, the importance of using the right metrics for judging the success of our accelerators and our programs for students, I think it's really important also that we are using the right metrics for judging the success of our investment in staffing. Um, and um, so, you know, it, it, I certainly want to credit credit all of you for being able to say that we're 99% staff. That we are making sure that you know our students are going into rooms that have that have teachers in them, right? That that we're there for our kids, um, and that was no easy feat. At the same time, I I think it's really important that the public understands what it took, you know, to to make that happen. You know, I mean, a lot of those are not. Staff members are not teachers um, who have been teaching in MCPS for years because we lost we lost a lot of those. Um, we have more uncertified teachers than ever in the classrooms. We have long-term subs who are picking up a lot of the pieces. There has had to be a lot of uh, creativity by administration, shuffling you know kids around and and what what classes can we can we afford to lose and how can we you know how can we pick up these pieces? Um, that's not what that's not what any of us want for our students. Um, so, uh, you know, and then of course there's, you know, unfilled positions that are, that are, that we're really seeing in places of very critical need, special education. Um, and, uh, with so, with so many missing spots in special education, of course, as with other places, but that is driving more of our, our remaining special ed teachers truly to the brink because they are trying to juggle more than any person can. And we can say the same thing about, you know, about counselors, about, you know, and, and all of these different categories. So um, I think it's really important that we're being, um, you know, telling those hard truths, uh, you know, to our colleagues on the council, but also to the public as we explain that uh, this is the type of investments that is needed to make sure that we're, we're fully staffed in the way that the public expects and that our kids deserve. And so um, it's a, it, I think that as we're talking about metrics and using the right metrics, um, let's make sure that we're doing that for staffing also and that we're sharing, we're sharing that language with, with the public because, um, you know, at this point, you know, th there's no shame in, in where we are. It's, we've been dealing with a really hard time, you know. So let's just tell those hard truths and let them know uh, why we need this level of investment to remedy the situation. And especially as we look at, um, you know, regional comparisons with salaries, uh, places that have a lower cost of living. Um, you know, one metric that we can look at is how, how far are we getting to make sure we're on track to meet the blueprint requir requirements. But more of interest to me, and I think probably to the public, is are we doing enough to make sure that we are retaining and attracting the talent, um, you know, qualitatively and, and quantitatively to make sure that our buildings are staffed uh, the way that we need them to be. And, um, you know, if we are meeting those blueprint metrics the same as all the other ju jurisdictions in the state that have lower costs of living, we are going to continue to bleed talent. So we have to really think strategically and, and big picture, even though it's hard and, and money is tight, it's not going to help us to spend a lot of money to take us three quarters of the way and still lose people. So let's make sure we're doing what we what we really need to do and being very realistic about that uh, and keeping these regional comparisons in mind um, and, and make sure that, well, obviously we need to meet the blueprint requirements. What we What we really need to do is make sure we're staffing our schools. Amen. Yeah. Had a conversation the other day, you know, when I worked at the U.S. Department of Education, uh, there was an initiative under Ernie Duncan to, you know, uplift the teaching profession. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a problem that we can't solve locally. We're going to need the federal government to, you know, to value our educators and value our school systems in a way. Um, I'm proud of what we do in the state of Maryland and in, in the Montgomery County to not be like many districts across the, across the country that are constantly struggling to fund schools and their their school systems have been deemed unconstitutional over and over again, but nothing is done because it's based on local property levies. We've done better here, but we still need to do better, you know, and um, 
I think it's a really good point that we don't want to set ourselves up uh, for, you know, half-stepping, as we used to call it. Um, okay, back to Mr. McGuire. Let's keep going. Half-stepping. <laughs> So back to a couple more uh, boring fiscal topics before we get back to that. Uh, I wanted to spend a, just a few moments to talk about the monthly financial report and the fund balance, which is an important consideration, and again, the revenues that support the MCPS budget year to year. Um, <clears throat> as was um, the, the, I believe it was Mr. Hall who went through um, the some of the elements of the fund balance that the school system does achieve at the end of every year. When we talk about the fund balance um, here at the council and in this analysis, we really are looking at just that portion that is truly undesignated and unassigned at the end of the year in terms of unexpended. We're not including the encumbrances and the inventories, student activities funds. There are a number of pieces, and I think sometimes sometimes there are numbers um, out there uh, that, that are larger. but. I do just want to be clear that the numbers I'm reflecting here are the truly unassigned fund balance at the end of the year. MCPS by law is required to end the year with a positive balance and not negative, and so as a result, um, we'll always end with a surplus, and that's a positive thing. We appreciate the prudent budgeting that gets to that point. That's, um, that's careful fiscal stewardship and absolutely a positive. And uh, typically, also under state law, the funds once appropriated to the school system cannot be used for any other purpose. So funds that are unspent by the school system at the end of the fiscal year fall to a fund balance. Um, the school system can't access them unless the council reappropriates them. The council can only reappropriate them to the school system. So it's a little bit of a closed system in that respect. The board's request for fiscal year 24 includes an assumption that there will be 25 million available at the end of FY23 to use as reappropriation for FY24. And typically for many, many years, uh, it has been the practice to, um, to appropriate dollars that will be end, left at the end of the year into the next year. The top of page seven uh, does show from the latest monthly financial report, and I would just note that the school system produces, again also by law, a monthly financial report. It's provided to the board every month, and uh, we look at those closely here as well. And the Education and Culture Committee reviews those on a more or less quarterly basis, but at least several times throughout the year. So we do, in that respect, keep, um, again, a careful uh, watch together on sort of how that spending is going over the course of the year. And as you can see in the table in the middle of page 7, um, <clears throat> the financial report is reflected in terms of uh, surplus or deficit in each individual state appropriation category. The uh, most recent report, which is the March 7th report, uh, reflects conditions as of the end of January and shows um, a potential deficit in maintenance of plant, which is category 11, the reason being attributed to uh, higher than expected HVAC repair costs, which is a theme we've heard in many different situations. So again, this is just, I wanted to just sort of elevate the example of how during the course of the year collectively we look at this from a macro spending level. Of course, the school system has to look at it at a much more micro level as well. But this is essentially the, um, the analysis that brings us to what are the funds that are going to be available at the end of the year. There's a table that starts on the bottom of page 7 of your packet and continues to the top of page 8 that shows the amount of fund balance that has been reappropriated um, as a resource for the following fiscal year, beginning with FY13 and carrying through, <clears throat> pardon me, to the 24 request. I do have to note I did make an error on this table. It's just my mistake. FY23, I listed it as $25 million. It was, in fact, 35 million, um, and again, I'll correct that in the future, but that, that just was a mistake on my part. So uh, as you can see in all of these years, um, going back to FY13, the lowest amount uh, really is FY13 at that $17 million level, and there have been significantly larger amounts since. Um, I can say that um, way back, uh, the numbers used to be much smaller, more like 7, 10, 12. The large, uh, the large accruals really began during the recession, um, in part because we had some overages with state aid, but also just because, again, there were savings plans countywide, and the school system was saving dollars as resources for the next years. So that pattern is sort of where we've gotten ourselves to uh, over time. Um, again, as you can see at this point, um, there is the continuing 
continuing carryover of a large amount of fund balance that then is able to be used for the next year, but also, um, again, represents funds that the school system is not spending during the year intentionally. Uh, and I say intentionally just, again, from a budgeting standpoint, not from any kind of other motive. Um, do you just want to note that the council's reserve and select fiscal policies resolution states that the that the council does not need should not budget a reserve for the MCPS current fund and that's because the county is really the largest reserve um, for the school system. The school system does not issue its bonds. We do. The college is a little different because it issues bonds. But nonetheless, um, that is the policy. Again, I do want to emphasize that under any conditions, the school system is going to end with a positive fund balance. That's a positive thing. We're not encouraging them not to do that. Um, but it is, uh, again, given sort of the scope of the request and where we are, maybe something to look at um, in the future in terms of what our future assumptions should be around that fund balance appropriation. Thank you, Ms. McGuire. I um, do want to pause here for a second. We did have a discussion about this last year on the previously constituted ENC committee, of which I was a member, um, about fund balance. It's something that comes up. Um, I do want to offer the, uh, the opportunity for the school system to address this recent trend, right, you know, in the sense that we've been at that $25 million level since 19. And uh, why, if you believe, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but do you think it's necessary for it to be at that level? Um, obviously, you all have a large budget. Um, and just is there, I want, we want to understand a little more, um, especially in light of the, the large request, how we're producing, how that's coming about every year and why you think, if you do, that it needs to stay there or couldn't be lower like it has been, and, you know, if you look at the last, 30 years at certain points been under 10 million. So if you could just address that, I think it's something we need to, to be clear on. Sure, and then I'm going to turn it over to my finance team to talk more specifically about the technical pieces of that. But as Ms. McGuire said, this has been a requirement of the school system for a while to be able to have that um, uh, $25 million fund, fund balance. And um, it is not an e always an easy feat, quite frankly, um, when we think about what the needs are and then having to reserve that. But at the same time, I'm going to say I understand the historical perspective of it. You know, essentially it is so that you're able to have that reserve if something happens that, you know, may not be predicted. Um, Council Member Abernoz mentioned earlier, um, you know, like what happens if a recession comes, you know, as we have to think about, you know, the future. I, if just to be clear, it's not a requirement. It's just the practice has become to do that. Is that it's an it's an internal kind of MCPS? You just are doing it. It's not. There's. It's not. You don't have to. Is my understanding. Well, I I have that I've amount. Always been that amount. It's required that you have a positive fund balance. That was that's clear. But the amount, my understanding. You can correct me if I'm wrong. That it's not a requirement. To be at that's actually amount. correct. Um, you guys actually don't require it. It's part of our budget process where we jointly determine what would be a, a reasonable amount. And speaking about reasonable amounts, so if I look at the other large school districts in the state, we are very low. That that traditional $25 million is extremely low compared to Prince George's and, and other large. And I think it's been more year to year. Correct, yeah. And I think that is a function of the size of our budget. Um, just to give you an idea, so our budget on average, we spend about $10 million a day if you, if you look at the working days. So $25 million doesn't you know, present a, a big cushion there. You know, personally and individually, like, people say we should have, people should say two to three months or six months even. Uh, we're a little different story because our funds are appropriated. We know what we're getting. But the expense side, um, there's a lot of different uh, factors that come into play. Um, so I personally, you know, I'm comfortable with the $25 million. Um, in the past, when it, when it was lower than that, I think it was a different world than um, just the fact that we have this big inflation number we're looking at now, I think that provides us, you know, the fact that we are at the 25. Um, and, and, and you were saying that, you know, how do we attain that? So through financial monitoring, you know, we're looking at on a monthly basis, or actually we're doing it on a daily basis to see where everybody everybody's landing. Um, but that, you know, we feel comfortable when we're doing that, we can get to that 25 million. Now to balance the budget last year, we actually, to do that, part of the strategy was to move that to $35 million, but we feel that's a little bit of an imposition. We do have to, to do that. We had to 
um, not necessarily take away from schools, but we just, it, it wasn't an easy feat to, to get to that 35 million. Yeah, and, that, and I'm glad you brought that up because that was another question that I had was, um, you know, and, and I take your point, I think it's important to look at other school districts. Again, we are ultimately, the county is your reserve, right? Not, you're not your reserve. So, you know, we're obviously not gonna let, we're giving half the budget to the schools. So I think there's a, there's a shared interest here in not letting the schools default. So to, to say that you only have one, you know, a day and a half of operating, I mean, it's not really that, because we, we are the backstop, not, not you, to, to the school funding. But um, I still take your point that that's a small amount of the budget uh, and you're required to have it be positive. But when you said that, I remember when that happened last year, when you had to adjust from 25 to 35, um, in a pretty short period uh, of time, um, it begs the question of, you know, just on the overall budget, you know, how were we able to do do that so quickly, and what was what went into that? Um, because you know, the question is, you know, on our fiscal responsibility side, you know, if we're moving around 10 million again in a three billion, not that I understand that. But it still is like, well, how can we do that on a dime, you know, so quickly? And I think people just want to understand how you said it was difficult. I think you should speak to it, you know, what went into that. It, uh, so just a little back, it was, it was around this time last year, right, where we realized we needed to do that. So we closed our um, accounting year end sooner um, and we put in spending restrict, uh, restrictions as well, too. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a freeze. We just analyzed all spending at that point on which we do anyway, but, but with the intention of saving that additional $10 million. Got it. Got it. Okay, so you kind of froze spending from this point on, and that was able, that was basically how you were able to achieve it. Dr. Matt, go ahead. No, okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Riley said it. That's exactly what we do. Um, we restrict the spending at that point in time, and so when we restrict the spending, the process is that we communicate to our schools, our staff, you know, at this Give point. Give me examples of what you restrict. Like, what, <laughs> what's the impact uh, now, on this point? Like, what yes. does that mean? Materials, like for instance, um, you know, whatever you have left in your fund to buy materials, which could be furniture, um, those types of things. At this point, essentially, if you don't have it yet in the year, we're going to assume that it is not a necessity. So that would be an example of a funding body, uh, um, a funding portion within a school that we would say, okay, you're going to have restricted funding there. Um, it may be um, supplies like, you know, paper use, those types of things. Now, of course, there's a benefit to that because it's like, you know, we want to be able to use other ways to uh, get information without having to use paper, but the amount of paper is, an exact, is something else that a school could see and feel a restriction with. Um, it would not hit areas like food, um, per se, that's provided centrally from, from the district. It, it wouldn't impact areas like that. So um, we're very thoughtful about it because we're always trying to project what, where, and how can the restriction um, happen without imposing processes that we know are coming up? Like, for instance, we wouldn't want schools to feel graduations being compromised coming up at the end of the year by restrictions such as this. Appreciate that. I'm going to ask just Ms. McGuire if you could work with the school system. I'd be curious as we go to full council to get the numbers of fund balance for all the 24 school districts. Do we have that? So I'm certainly, we, I'm sure we can find it. I do just want to caution that there's going to be a lot of differences among the structures. So certainly we, just thinking out loud, we would probably only want to do that from the charter counties. I mean, again, there's going to be differences um, in terms of what they are required to, um, how those funds are accounted for, what the school systems are required to um, be supporting with those funds. Um, you know, for example, in some of the districts, the debt service is handled differently. In some of the districts, the benefit funds are, I mean, I mean there's, there's just a number of differences. If we can get to the actual unassigned fund balance, um, we can certainly look at that. It's as close as apples to apples as you can. I know we're, we are unique. And so if there, if there are in the large charter counties, even if there were five or six that we could look at that where we could kind of compare? Well, and I do think that it's really a question um, in terms of what the appropriate level is. I agree that, again, that absolutely in a budget this big, the school system will end in the positive. That has to occur, and we support that occurring. I think the question just comes if there is perpetually an amount that the practice has been to, to save to carry over, what is the assumption we should make around that practice going forward? So I, it, it's really a question about our financial accounting. Absolutely. I'm happy to look at examples, but again, the, the question of how the school system is managing an appropriated budget 
they will need to manage through the financial monitoring that's been described. And it is thorough. I lived it. It's, it's, it's thorough. Um, but again, if, if the practice is to intentionally carry through an amount that's unspent, the question is, should we continue to yeah, do Yeah, is that a good practice? I, I agree. Whatever the amount is. Yes, sir. Can I just add in, uh, we were talking about um, you guys are our funding source, and I know the policy says zero fund balance, but just in a practical uh, way for that to happen, um, and we do a great job of mon monitoring our cash, but if we got to middle of June and we were negative on cash, as, as Ms. McGuire said, that would be an issue, and it might not be as easy to get the money from you guys as, as possible. So it would, it would create an audit finding if we were negative, and it's happened in other LEAs, specifically in the EBP funds, in their employee benefit funds, where they were negative, they had to borrow from the county, and it's, a, it's not a good audit finding. It, it looks, makes it look like we're not managing our cash well. So just, just a couple quick yeah, things just on hold, that. Before I, you do that, can you just identify yourself because we didn't do that. Oh, sorry. I'm uh, Robert Riley, Associate Superintendent of Finance. Thank you, sir. I apologize. Um, so the employee benefit funds are a different matter. That's a different fund and have, has a different fund balance policy. So I just want to be clear, I'm not, in, I'm, th that's a separate fund matter. Um, also, just to um, emphasize that the, um, the, the point would not be to get to zero. The policy says not to budget a standing reserve. So that's certainly, again, the point is going to be north of zero. That's the requirement. Um, but the policy is not to budget a standing reserve. Got it. And if I could just quickly bring us to the current fiscal year. Um, so, and I will say that the financial monitoring that MCPS does is phenomenal. Uh, I am new to the district, so I take no credit for this, uh, but I've been in three uh, large urban school, or three large school districts now, uh, and this is the best I've ever seen. So as we're looking at the books for this current year, we actually recently sent out a communication to our departments and to our schools, letting them know of the spending cutoff uh, that we realize that we need to implement actually earlier than last year just to reach the 25 million for this current year and that 25 million is included in the revenue projections that we built this budget on so that 25 million is in there if we were to adjust the fund balance and that is certainly a conversation uh, that we, we got our calculator out for I know, all sorry, right wonderful <laughs> check my math <laughs> certainly a conversation I didn't mean to I really didn't. I didn't. <laughs> we said we were about accountability here <laughs> Its own. That's right. So I, I was just going to just note that it, th that is a conversation that we would be open to, um, but it would be a one-time infusion, right? Once we lower that one time, you can't go back to the well again. And I just want to clarify, absolutely, the, um, the, the suggestion here is not about the current revenue structure, the 25 that's built into the, to the 24 budget. That's, that is part of the assumption. Understood. That's what I'm making. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to better understand, and maybe this is, if we're going to follow up on this conversation, then maybe it's a question to be d dug into more there. But it just feels like a doubling up of reserves to me. I mean, the county has reserves, and MCPS has reserves, and we are your funding source. And I hear you that if you came to us and then we didn't give you the funds and it called you to default, uh, it caused you to default, that would be a problem. Um, I mean, that would be an us problem. So, you know, I think we would like you to be able to trust us and rely on us. And so this would require, of course, more collaboration uh, and close communication about, about your needs and so on on an ongoing basis. But ideally, you know, we would have a school system that, that feels that they can trust and rely upon the county to ensure that you are not put in that situation, which would, of course, be very problematic for us as well. And so if we have this $25 million, which I understand that it's, it's a drop in a bucket in in, in, inside of a much larger number, but it's not a drop in the bucket to our taxpayers. I mean, that's, a, that's more than a whole percentage point of the property tax that we're talking about. So, you know, we have to be, that's a number we need to be really responsible with and, uh, and make sure that there's a, a really good reason to do that. And it's certainly it's only a one, it would only be a one-time infusion of funds. Um, but I mean, let's say we spent that on recruitment bonuses. Well, now we're staffed, they're more likely to stay, you know, we're, we're working to get, to get our, our, our staffing, our salaries up to par and, and so on. That would be really useful, you know. Um, planning funds, there's, there's a lot of one-time expenses that we could use right now. So I think I, I want to make sure that we're not saying, well, we've done this for a number of years, so, so let's keep doing it. And I also don't want it to be, we can't rely on you to come through when we need to, because that means we need a, a closer partnership and I think we're moving towards that. So I, I look forward to continuing this conversation. This is definitely an area that I have, um, uh, where I, I think there might be some opportunities. Yeah, and, and to that point, um, if you can speak to it now, you can get back to us. Like, you know, just on the, over the last several years, what is that, um, 
where is that fun balance coming from? Like, what are you not doing or the, could you do, you know, f to reserve that money, you know, and how, how those decisions are made? I know it's not going to be one thing, but. Yep. So I can speak to that at a high level. Um, you know, a lot of the savings for that would come through um, the vacancy and turnover as, you know, we, someone leaves, you're not able to fill the position immediately. So there is that lapse. And then the other is closing the books early and just making sure as we're monitoring every single month um, that it, with that as a target, if we're, you know, approaching the end of the year and we're not looking like we're going to meet that, that's when we might say, you know, we're going to close down spending um, this year just to save those additional dollars to make sure that we do make it to that point. Yeah, just to, I wanted to say I didn't insinuate that. I don't trust you guys. It's just a matter of logistics. <laughs> we, we, we know. We understand. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. So let's move on to state aid. Just uh, thank you. Just a couple of brief comments on state aid. Uh, so MCPS did receive a significant increase of state aid, uh, 69.5 million over the approved FY23 level. Um, the superintendent's recommended budget submitted in December had a much more modest increase estimated of 15 million, and as a result, the Board of Education had addi additional state revenue of 54. Point five million to factor into its budget action. I will just say predicting state aid is very, very challenging. And there have been years where the superintendent's budget uh, estimates can, you know, high. There have been years where the superintendent's budget estimates low. It's very challenging in part because there are a number of factors that we can't predict and we don't know the answer to until MSD do, MSDE does its own calculations. So that is just always a variable. But this year, um, certainly we were very uh, happy to see uh, such a positive increase over the estimated amount. Um, the board, the board's budget did request both an increase in the local contribution over the superintendent's budget as well as adding the additional state aid to the overall total of the budget um, and that is one uh, th those two revenues together brought their total the board's total to 60.7 million above the amount requested by the superintendent in previous years it certainly has been typical where some of the additional state aid if there is a state aid increase over the superintendent's recommendation is often used by the board to help offset some of the county contribution just want to notice a couple note a couple of points about the state revenue State aid to MCPS actually decreased uh, a little bit in the foundation grant, uh, what used to be known as the GCEI, Geographic Cost of Education, and the Blueprint Allocation. Those are um, the sort of cross the board per pupil categories, and I think it's um, entirely plausible that our uh, the decrease that we received there, while we have more students, um, most likely reflects an increase in relative wealth across the state. And again, that's one of those variables that we just can't predict. Um, our state aid increased in the categories related to students with specific needs, primarily students who are economically disadvantaged, English learners, and students with disabilities. So again, while we have more students overall, um, just want to note that trend in state funding, which can be a concerning trend where our per pupil is going down in some areas and our, our increases are really because of increases in certain um, student categories. Um, our blueprint funding also did decrease by 4.7 million. The largest category of decrease, and those categories are outlined for you on page 9 of your packet, was in the pre-K funding. Now, I do want to <coughs> caution that a portion of the pre-K funding for last year was a pass through to private providers, so that reduction is not actually a loss to the system. Um, nonetheless, uh, certainly our blueprint funding, as has been noted, is in a lot of transition, um, just as we sort of work through this, um, again, the transition between the old funding structure, the new funding structure. There will be increases in some areas related to blueprint. There will also be shifting to the local as a responsibility. And I think this underscores the work that we have to do. And it, we just approved a special appropriation yesterday for uh, COA around the early child who's coordinating our early childhood education entity. Um, the fact that the state funding has dropped, we need to figure out how we're going to support expansion of early childhood education uh, and uh, you know I'll channel Councilmember Navarro who always advocated for a dedicated funding stream for that um, and I think it's just something that if we're going to expand the way we'd like to expand the way our neighbors have expanded we're going to have to do something differently um, in partnership with the whole system not just the school system but I uh, just wanted to s mention that point um, any points on state aid from colleagues um, okay yeah, yeah we're going to get to that yeah 
Uh, just briefly highlighting, Esser, uh, what, what is in the packet, uh, as was noted earlier, on the bottom of page 9 and then all of page 10 are the detailed um, budget breakdowns that the school system has compiled regarding the three ESSER grants uh, that, uh, that MCPS received as a result, and ESSER, I apologize, stands for Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief. I uh, tend to throw that one around, ESSER. Uh, so, of course, MCPS... I'm confused with ESEA or any, exactly. any other yeah. education laws. Pick some other letters. Um, so these tables do show the allocations for all three grants. Uh, ESSER 1 has been completed, which uh, it was, it, it, its time expired uh, last fall. ESSER 2, uh, the spending end date is September of this calendar year, and ESSER 3, the spending end date is September of next calendar year. Um, so again, you do see the purposes allocated here. Um, the award has broad eligibility, and of the totals, 146 million has not yet been expended or encumbered, which means it is available to be spent by MCPS on eligible purposes. Um, again, it has been allocated. Certainly, as the school system has said, the school's uh, system has identified how it intends to spend these dollars, but the 146 that are as of yet unencumbered can be, a, can be used for the, the purposes here or any eligible purpose. Um, the FY24 budget does assume that approximately 3.7 million of technology supports previously funded through F ESSER will be shifted to the general operating budget. Certainly there's still a significant amount of technology funding left in the ESSER allocations and that um, certainly would be one of the areas that um, could be an area for continuation. Uh, as was mentioned, the school system uh, indicates that it will uh, evaluate the ESSER funding to see what would be continued. Um, another note in terms of likely continuation, there are 43 positions supported through F ESSER, which includes social workers and restorative justice. Again, certainly likely that at least a majority of those would continue past the grant. And that, uh, I'll pause there. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I know Councilmember Mink, I think, has some questions on that, sir. Okay, I'll come back to you. Um, I do have a question, um, and Gabe, just let me know if you have any. Uh, so this point of allocated versus used and, and two, two buckets of questions. So the, um, Ms. McGuire mentioned that there's 14.2 million in ESSER 2 and 138.1.8 in ESSER, 2, ESSER 3 that has not been spent but has been allocated and, and it's and there are broad categories in the packet here you know summer school some more more opaque than others but you know summer school is really clear tutoring wellness programs contract you know um, mental health counseling which has with it for example the 43 FTEs that were mentioned could you talk about the uh, the process of fa phasing this out uh, over next year and what you at this point can say about what the need will be going forward in the base budget. And you can use the, if you want to start with the example of the mental health counseling professionals, is it your intention to keep those 43 FTEs past ESSER 3 funding? Let's just start with that. So I will ask staff to uh, assist me in talking through some of the specifics. And I don't know that we want to go through it line by line. I will say that um, some of, there have been some priorities that we've just um, been having much conversation about with within the system, with our Board of Education, with stakeholders that are really important that we want to make sure we maintain. I can speak to it from, from that level, like for instance, um, summer school. We know that, that for, considering the fact that we don't, we only have two extended year schools, research says consistently and repeatedly to help make up for learning disruption that occurred during COVID-19, students need more time. And without having many more extended school models, which gives them more time in the regular calendar school year, summer school is a really important substitute for that. Um, and so summer school and, and um, being able to pay for many more students having access to summer school and not having the fiscal responsibilities that go along with that has been one that we um, would want to continue to invest in until we are seeing ground being made up academically um, in which that need does not present itself in the way that it does now, knowing that this is our first year coming out of the pandemic. 
Um, another area that we've continued to um, use ESSER funds for is professional, de professional development. Another area that we continue to, to see much research supports that we have to continue to invest in our staff and their learning so that they are equipped to meet the needs of our students. And so specifically, and I'll just say one that <laughs> we have planned for, you know, this summer is one that we are going to have an institute where teachers are able to come in and receive professional development in curriculum study. How does that curriculum study play out for students at various levels in the classroom? How does that then also play into engagement all around the foundation of the anti-racist audit, which gets at expectations, high expectations for all children? Um, and how do you provide that instruction to them in a meaningful way? Um, and so you'll see professional development as another priority. Um, so you, you'll, you'll see those areas. I must say technology has been one that has been a significant area that we've used ESSER funding for, for several reasons. One, um, we needed more technology than we ever needed before when we were in the pandemic because that was our only means of being able to educate our students. So we had to make big investments up front. Now, we're in a post, I won't say post-world pandemic, <laughs> but in a very different place, but what we've learned, last, learned over the last couple of years is how we engage and utilize technology in a variety of different ways. Our components of our teaching and learning process that we want to keep. When I talked about the teacher showcase earlier um, in our presentation, that was an example of how do we go beyond just the Chromebook or the laptop provide it to the teacher and the student to say this is the way in which we are educating. How do we go beyond that? So given the fact that it's the technology is, is a great example of using one-time funds to purchase products, that's been a big point uh, of leverage in using the, using the ESSER funds as well. Now that helps us, right? Because that means we're able to take advantage of much more material that requires only a one-time cost. But then we have to think about the maintenance. Right. Um, and so that's a big part of the consideration that I would say that while ESSER funds have been very helpful in the area of technology, we have to consider the maintenance in the operating budget. So those are some things that I'll highlight that we've had in um, ESSER 2 that can be some funds that we, again, invested in that we know won't need continued maintenance. But some of the areas of being able to provide more time for students to learn, that tutoring for them, and I mean, it's, some of it's provided virtually, some of it's provided based on the school's decision in person before or after school. That's a part of our catch-up method that we, we must uh, stay astute to until we see us, our students and their learning coming out on the other side of the pandemic. I appreciate that. And we had a session on tutoring with your staff, and, and there's a lot to follow up there. I mean, I think as a follow-up on this in the committee, we should just come back to this topic of ESSER. Mm -hmm. And as you're making those evaluations and decisions of what will transfer, what will need to be in the base budget next year, I just think we just all need to be in, in conversation on that. Um, so I'm going to go to Councilmember Mink and then Councilmember Alvarez. I yeah, just wanted to, uh, to agree with that sentiment. It would be helpful to know for the conversations moving forward to get even more specificity um, about what's falling in each of these line items and um, so, so that we can really talk about the evaluation of data associated with each when we, you know, decisions have to be made about what's going to be continued and what's, gonna, what's not going to be continued. Um, and I also wanted to note in, re in uh, regards to the um, Institute uh, looking at curriculum um, following the anti-racist audit, which is wonderful. Um, I just wanted to know, I don't know if you've We've had some conversations about this, but also as we think about making sure that we're integrating, um, that we're including the LGBTQIA plus community, that they're fully represented in our in our curriculum and in our schools, um, that the results of the anti-racist audit um, can be really helpful in kind of informing how we do that. And so hopefully that's also part of that that institute as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Councilmember um, thanks. So th this is a challenge that's being you know, in all of our county government's uh, agencies. So the Department of Health and Human Services is going through the same exercise, trying to figure out how we're going to continue programs that were established during COVID through ARPA funds. Uh, so for example, our food hubs, which were unequivocally a success, have been a really extraordinary silver lining and really strong model. Uh, we have funding in place to continue that moving forward, but we, we, 
we've had to be judicious <laughs> with those resources, knowing they were one-time funds. Um, I just high-level question. Um, obviously, the HVAC issue continues to be a very significant one, um, and some of those operational needs, those capital needs, are one-time. So I just am curious as to how, because I, I see it's a small percentage of, of the overall funds that have been expended, and we just a couple of weeks ago um, passed an appropriation for additional HVAC needs. Just wanted to hear a little bit more from a facilities issue whether that would be possible to look at for some of these unexpended funds. Sure. So um, specifically around SO3, the, the parameters, the guidelines would allow for that. It would simply be a matter of um, what are we not going to do that we are currently planning on doing? Are we going to, you know, reduce the scale of tutoring or summer school or one of these other um, items? So certainly uh, allowable, and I think once we get a little bit further through the budget process, uh, both on the CIP side and, and the operating side, we'll have a better sense of kind of uh, where that fits in with all of this. But it would, because this, the money is all allocated currently, it would mean reductions um, somewhere on this list. And if I could just uh, say as well, and I don't want to take credit for this either because this was done long before I got here, but the team has done a really good job of limiting the number of positions that they put on ESSER. Uh, in my previous district, uh, that wasn't the case, and they're going to have a hard time coming off of this. So you see the positions really just in one category here, 43 of them. Um, so figuring out how to move those over is something that will be prioritized. And I also just want to note that uh, we are evaluating these programs, our Office of uh, Shared Accountability. Um, we, we're meeting regularly to go over what those evaluations look like so that when we get to later in the spring into the summer, uh, we're going to be building the FY25 budget soon, and that will not include ESSER funds. And so figuring out uh, what stays and what goes. There are a number of things on here. Um, you know, again, targeting one-time expenses like special education. I, I think uh, you mentioned that those were some of our most impacted students. And so that uh, money is largely allocated for compensatory services and making sure that we get them caught up. Um, and so hopefully that money is not needed in future years, much like uh, the tutoring. Uh, well, that is something that we'll look to continue at some level. Hopefully as our students recover from the pandemic, uh, the need is not as great in that area. Uh, if you look at the virtual academy, you see a very small amount left there. Most of that, uh, virtually all of that has been moved over to the operating budget already. <laughs> Um, as the superintendent noted with technology, a lot of that was for one-time purchases, uh, such as the uh, box lights, which are the electronic boards that the teachers use in the classrooms. So trying to get those re uh, refreshed and replaced while we do have this one-time money. Um, but one of the things that we have on technology is hotspots. Uh, for the family, our families that don't have internet at home, and that would be an example of something that can't go away. We know that our students, all of our students, need and deserve access to the internet at home to level the playing field, at least to some measure, and so that would be an example of something that we would need to figure out a way to move over and maintain. Yeah, I just, we, we, we have to set ourselves up for success here. Um, the tutoring will still be necessary a year from now, let's be honest. So uh, if we're setting up programs that we know we probably won't be able to fund beyond FY24, then we have to be honest about that um, because FY25 is going to be much worse than this year. So um, I, I do think that as difficult as it is, oh, there's no question there's needs in every single one of these categories. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll follow up with this. I have some follow-up thoughts on it. Um, but I, I just think it would be wise for us to look at some of those infrastructure issues that do actually raise all boats. Um, we're, we've got some tough capital decisions that we've got to make. Um, so just, and, and it's a concern we've heard consistently, both from teachers, administrators, and parents and teachers uh, and, and students, um, you know, with the classrooms being unusually hot or unusually cold, um, which impacts the overall instruction. So. I'll uh, yield back to the chair, but I'm, I'm going to come back to this one. Thank you. And I, I did want to ask a specific question, um, which is in here, but also just I've heard from parents on special education. So the S or two dollars looks like you uh, you mentioned, Mr. Hall, that most of that is for compensatory services. That is that true for S or two and the allocated, but mostly unspent for S or three. I believe that is the case. I'll uh, ask Dr. Murphy if he can uh, add any details around the special education services. 
else that I see that we are uh, recognizing uh, an increase in the services that we're having to provide, uh, and you know that's something that's going to continue to need our attention. Um, individuals come to this county for the services that we do provide through special education, and and we you know hold that as a priority. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to, and you guys can come back. We have more sessions, but on this point, I have you know compensatory services, for example. If you were offered it sometime during the school year, did or did not accept it, how, when can you can you still sign up? Uh, I've heard very specific questions from folks about that, and then and, and the relation of that to this unspent money, for example, like if you look at the 17.8 budgeted, only 0.2 has has been expended. So right, so you have 70.6 in this ESSER, and that might be because you spent all the of S or two and you don't need to I just I'm just I want to understand that more yes. about the relationship of the funding but also if you if you're a parent that's watching and is like hey I didn't know about that can I still get my child those services absolutely we can send a follow-up to that outlining specifically what services are provided in that right. funding in the category of special education S or three appreciate that and then how long you anticipate this to go and last through I mean, obviously it has to be spent by 24 so we know that's the so I guess it would be this school year and next school year Yes. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. Just wanted to note also the connection between staffing and some of this programming because you know in, in some cases if we're if we're fully staffed if we have all of the special ed teachers and if we have all of the one on one hours that we need which we definitely do not but if we did then there might be less need for some of these other programmatic things so you know just making sure that we are, are seeing that connection and putting uh, funding in the places where this is going to be our long term systemic solution um, and, and not necessarily doubling up on, on effort by going. You know, halfway in both places, if that makes sense. All right, uh, let's keep going. So the next section um, is to highlight the um, racial equity and social justice statements uh, that MCPS uh, put forward discussing how the work of the school system in each area contributes to racial equity and social justice. Of course, um, this budget analysis of racial equity and social justice impact is a requirement of the Racial Equity and Social Justice Act that the council passed um, and uh, is applied across all of the departments and agencies. I will say I think that MCPS's um, level of intentional documentation is very is very high and very thorough around how uh, various areas of the budget and also just various program areas really do uh, speak to that element of the core mission of the system and of course a core value of the county as a whole. As a documentation standpoint, uh, MCPS provided as part of the superintendent's December budget submission a statement that is associated with each functional chapter. The superintendent's budget is organized according to sort of just the functional chapters of the budget um, uh, and how the work is organized. Each chapter then has a statement that again documents um, the overarching way that that work uh, supports racial equity and social justice. Those statements, the packet really just took sort of a cliff notes approach to describing that, but all of the statements are also provided for you as an attachment to your packet, and of course, again, can be found in the superintendent's submission. I just want to commend you for the work here. I, I think, you know, so we're going to go over this quickly, but we shouldn't, in that the care and thought that goes into racial equity and everything that you all are doing, we're going to have a deeper session on the results of the, and recommendation and implementation of the anti-racist system audit after we get through the budget, but I, I think, you know, this was, this is what we should be doing and we're thinking about every time, so I just want to call that out. Go ahead. So the next section of the packet really dives more into the expenditure side, some of which, of course, we've talked about earlier. Um, the the table of the breakdown is a t is repeated on the top of page 13 of your packet. What you have on page 14 is uh, just a listing. It is literally an itemized listing of all of the accelerators um, that are recommended in the um, board's budget. Um, now, a number of these, again, thematically, this, the, the committee will be coming back to a lot of this. The math and literacy in particular and other instructional support elements will be more thoroughly discussed in your next work session. Some of the operational pieces around security would be in the third one, and we'll talk about blueprint in a few minutes. Um, but again, um, the, this does document sort of a, on a very granular 
granular level, um, the changes that the school system is putting forward, the board is putting forward um, as part of its budget. Just wanted to reproduce those here. I don't know if you want to ask any questions about these at this moment or if you want to wait for those later discussions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we'll wait and have a more fulsome dis discussion of the accelerators next session. Yep. When you have the people here that probably different people. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, MCPS does annually review its operating budget to as it prepares the next year's budget to determine potential internal reductions in realignments or savings. This year, um, there was a total of 12.2 million and six FTE uh, identified as either able to be reduced or again realigned for another purpose. Um, so again, that's uh, that that amount then was not needed in additional dollars. Moving. Oh, did you? Okay. Moving on to positions, the board's budget, as we noted, adds a total of 539 uh, FTE. So there's a board, there's a table that's in the board's budget every year. It's Table Five. I like Table Five because it does um, it breaks down all of the FTEs according to these functional categories, and it's just a very um, useful way to look at uh, sort of how the positions break out in MCPS over time, and again, just a comparison of where the relative um, person power uh, is across the system. What you have on page 15 uh, is uh, the new positions are all categorized according to these categories, so you can see um, all of the additions in each of the areas. What you have on page 16 of your packet um, is a quick trend analysis um, that I did relative to, again, sort of a pre-pandemic snapshot of FY18 and the change through to the FY24 request. Um, Understanding that, again, those intervening years were consumed by the pandemic and so makes for sort of odd comparisons. Um, but what we do see is that the categories with the largest percent growth across that time really are the support services categories. And I think that that does accurately reflect um, a great deal of the focus and experience over the course of the pandemic, including well-being and mental health supports for students, um, non-teacher positions such as um, instructional, some instructional assistance, um, some of the the additional therapy positions. There are a number of sort of categories of, of support that again um, show as the larger percent increases here. Um, some of the positions most directly impacted by enrollment, such as teachers, grew somewhat but not as much, which again reflects the enrollment um, experience during the pandemic as well. So again, just wanted to kind of uh, show the assortment of positions both in the current request and in the last few years. Appreciate that. Um, so 539 FTEs, uh, uh, you know, obviously we have a large school system, so, you know, serving our 162,000 plus students. Um, on the, I just wanted to ask, and we've talked about this before, Dr. McKnight, the, the, the uh, PPWs, the pu pupil personnel workers, um, it, if I'm reading this correctly, you're on, this is asking for one additional. Uh, if, if across the, I see that in the second other professional, and I want to make sure I'm reading it correct, correctly. Um, it's an area that I've heard just in my tours and going through the schools that there is a need there. Uh, they cover multiple schools most of the time. Um, you know, in, it's particularly in some of our schools that have um, really high truancy issues and attendance issues. These are the workers that can, you know, be part of the team that goes out and goes to the home and things like that. Could you just ex talk to me a little bit about the thought process there and do you, are you seeing that same need and just speak to that, please. Absolutely. So the people personnel worker position is one that is, has always been critically important. Um, in terms of the positions that we have here, we, of course, are thinking about what can we handle, um, what we can't. And I will say this is probably one that we might want to anticipate um, increasing over time. And when I say that, I say it because we've also experienced something very different in the district, which is um, attendance. We've had to address attendance issues very differently after, after the pandemic because unfortunately some of our students saw that they were still able to be educated without physically being in the buildings and so we're trying to work on that from an engagement perspective of what we have them doing and how we're in, how we interacted with them when they're in school so that they want to be there but the second part is to be able to have the staff to help figure out for those who are not coming what are the challenges so that we can be more intentional in the people personnel worker position is one that 
um, has been able to help us do that. So it's been a balance, though, of trying to determine what positions we want to increase and which others we don't. We talked about the mental health positions, right? Over the last couple of years, those are positions that we really invested in in creating and increasing over time, given the need. Um, I think there is much more to be seen about the pupil personnel work as we address some of the, um, the attendance issues that we've seen in the system coming forward. So thank you for asking that. I think it's a great opportunity to foreshadow an issue that, that we have to continue to work on and what's, what staff is particularly needed to address it. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Uh, mm -hmm. Councilmember Mink. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I noticed that the budget request in, uh, increases administrative FTEs at a higher rate than teacher and instructional aid FTEs. Um, so I just wanted to dig into that a little bit, into what those administrative positions are for. Um, we could do that now or we could hold that for a future conversation as well, but I think that that, that was something that jumped out at me. Yes, uh, thank you for that. So um, while the per percentage, you write, is higher, the, the total number, you know, I think there's about 10 times as many of the teachers as there are of, of the administrators. And so it, part of it is just the math and the, the denominator is much smaller. And so that makes the percentage look much larger. Um, I, I mean, I could speak to a few, few of the accelerators now, but I think it might behoove us to uh, do that next time, as you said, with kind of a larger discussion where we can look at it more holistically than p trying to pull out individual ones, if that's okay. We'll hold that, we'll hold that conversation for the accelerators. Great. Council Member Alvarez. Um, thank you. So the security issues have been well documented. I thought we had a productive session recently, uh, which was a joint session to, to talk about those challenges. There are obviously some projected increases. Similar as a follow-up, I'd like to learn a little bit more about um, what how that plan that we discussed in the joint committee session last month is being reflected in what is being presented in this budget um, because it continues to be an overarching issue um, that we hear consistently from parents and families. Thank you. Yep, I nice. got those 14.125. I don't know how you do the 1.25, but I guess it's ours, obviously, but uh, of a security assistance in here in, in this line item. Yes, did you say something? Yes, I did want to say um, I'm look, thinking about our upcoming um, agendas, and it may go beyond, well, it should go beyond the discussion around safety and security, beyond our budget conversations and in, into Education and Culture Committee, because, yes, as you've stated, Council Member Abelnaz, um we have allocation here, but we've done a lot of different things over the last couple of years as it relates to safety and security. And we're in a very different environment than we were prior to the pandemic, given the needs that exist. And so I think as we continue, and oh, one other very important context, there are things happening nationally that we constantly hear from our parents and saying, you know, what happens when this situation occurs or if this situation occurs? People have real fears, and I do understand that. And so I think as we continue to talk about how we utilize all these resources and how we do that in a forward way collectively across our county, um, that is one that I look forward to us continuing to highlight in this discussion in terms of what does it look like in this budget, and then measuring or, or talking about the impact of some of those investments and what we're learning along the way, because I do believe we're going to walk away from some of the experiences that we've had and looking at new processes and procedures and initiatives that we've put forward that will make us, you know, really think about overall, what do we want the safety and security to look like in Montgomery County overall and the schools being a part of that. So definitely, I, I was trying to figure out which meeting would be most appropriate for us to dig into that a little bit more deeply, um, but we'll yield to you on that. Yeah, I think we put security on the third meeting. Yeah, so, okay. yeah, yeah, and, and okay. I, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm being told we did. Okay. So, yeah, so the third meeting is, is where we have, because you're right, it's a huge issue. Uh, we had a good joint session, um, and we do want to talk about that, and, and uh, if you think about the issues our community cares about, mm -hmm. it's, top, it's one of the top issues. And many of them go across the agencies, like I said, you know, think about Department of Health and Human Services. It was during the pandemic that we talked about the importance of having a mobile crisis unit, you know, to support mental health. But, you know, also what does, what does it look like across agency? And I, the more we talk about that, I think the more we can get that uh, outlay of the fiscal picture beyond where we are right now across agencies, which is clearly what we all seek to achieve. Absolutely. All 
right. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, all right, Ms. McGuire. <clears throat> Just uh, continuing on positions briefly, um, the uh, in preparing the operating budget, one of the major uh, funding pieces that MCPS identifies is something that they call continuing salaries, which is the amount that's needed to increase the budget to continue and carry over existing employees and positions. For FY24, this amount was identified as $105.4 million. I would just note certainly that's um, the initial budget estimate and a number of things are in flux um, uh, around uh, negotiations and other factors. MCPS also estimates approximately $40 million of laps in FY24, which as was referenced earlier is the amount of savings that will naturally occur through turnover and through delay any delays in hiring um, uh, which again with a system of this size is going to be sizable um, that lapse assumption is approximately two two percent and that is consistent with um, prior years assumptions for lapse and turnover savings um, we have as was mentioned earlier of course had a number of uh, conversations over the course of the year regarding hiring in MCPS um, we do have some uh, vacancy information that was provided MCPS uh, that's reproduced in your packet on page 17 MCPS did provide the following information regarding teacher vacancies both at the beginning of the year in October and then again more recently as an update um, and also uh, current school year data does show potentially an increased use of long-term substitutes as was mentioned as well as an increased length of service again just looking to try to compare the current experience with the pre-pandemic we took we took it from FY19 um, just to look at that and while we don't have a full year this year obviously if the trend were to continue it would end a little bit higher Councilmember Mank has a question about the uh, vacancies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, clarify what numbers are included uh, as vacancies. How are we seeing you know, long-term subs and um, uncertified teachers and, and so forth? How are those being reflected in, in the numbers? And also noting that um, I have some numbers from March uh, 29th that do show greatly increased vacancies, um, but I also i am not sure if I'm looking at apples to apples because of those questions. Sure. So I can I can start um, with that. So the staffing of our schools is obviously a top priority and a top concern, as has been discussed uh, throughout this meeting. And uh, part of what we believe this budget request helps us accomplish uh, is uh, being able to recruit and retain staff better, not just uh, from the salary piece, which is critical. Um, but also additional uh, investments in our HR department so that we are really um, able to compete in this new landscape. There are many, many fewer people going into and completing education programs than there were a decade ago. And so there are just fewer teachers out there than there used to be. And that means more competition for the, those teachers. And so we really need to focus both on how we're recruiting them, but also how we're retaining them. And that includes professional development. And that is addressed um, in, through some of our uh, budget requests as well. I do want to note that one of the programs that we have rolled out this year um, in consultation with uh, our association partners is a permanent sub program. So uh, we know that we have some schools that have long term vacancies. And while that is never um, ideal and never something that we want any of our schools and our students to experience, we have found that one of the more effective ways of addressing that is making sure that we have a permanent substitute in that school so that they're not struggling on a day to day basis to find a daily sub and so uh, our intention intentionally uh, putting those people in the schools for a long period of time to cover these long-term vacancies um, would push up of course the number uh, and the time of service and so uh, I think that it's it's twofold part of it is reflected in in just the pure vacancies that we're working to address and the other is one of the ways that we are addressing those is by providing stability through the permanent sub program Okay, and so then to be clear, the numbers that we're looking at in the packet, do those numbers, uh, do those vacant lists of, you know, when you're counting the vacancies for the numbers in the packet, are those including those long-term subs or as because ideally we would want to replace them with our regular FTEs or, or not? So I, I can't speak specifically to the data here. Um, I guess I'm not exactly sure where that came from, but my, my understanding is that it does. 
that that was provided um, from from the system. So I, I don't though have more information about what's behind it. Um, that was the information I was provided. So we could follow up. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. I'm looking at some numbers that that I believe. Um, are inclusive, uh, are counting those um, long-term subs as as vacancies. Yeah, the person who produced the data. We, we, oh. we can bring up our chief, uh, acting chief of HR here, Dr. Susan Marks, to uh, more specifically address this. I want to do less punting and more answering. There you go. <laughs> Excuse me, it's having a little post-nasal drip and I didn't want it. So <laughs> I stepped out for a moment. May I uh, repeat the question, please? If you just introduce yourself. And we oh, can so I'm things. Susan Marks. I'm the Acting Chief of Human Resources and Development. Thank you for being here, um, Ms. Marks. Yeah, we're looking at the numbers in the packet um, that are listed as regarding teacher vacancies, both at the beginning of the year and more recently. So those are October 25th, 22, and uh, January 25th, um, 23. Uh, and then I also have additionally some numbers um, that I got from March 29th of 2023. And I'm just not sure if I'm comparing apples to apples, but I wanted to understand if the numbers in the packet, um, if those include long-term subs, for instance, um, as vacancies, right? Any positions which we ideally, which the public would ideally, right, have us fill um, with, with an FTE, what, you know, what are we looking at here? Uh those vacancies are, are those that are posted as vacancies. So if there's a long-term sub in the position, we don't count them as vacancies. Okay. Okay. So um, it would be great to have th those numbers because that will really give us um, a fuller picture of how many people are we really trying to recruit here. So maybe for next time we can. Absolutely. Oh, well, and I, I do, um, just on this point, though, I think, um, so some, I guess the question is, because some long-term subs are because there's a vacancy where someone's not coming back. Some long-term subs are there because someone is coming back, perhaps extended right. leave. So I guess that's where perhaps the, because, um, and the system did provide long-term sub um, numbers, which I'm happy to share, but that's what went into the, the description here. But again, we would need to separate out the long-term subs that represent a vacancy. Would there be long-term subs that, represent a vacancy that's not shown here? Because it, it, does that make sense as a question? Yeah. yeah. Because some long-term subs, again, are, are for right. people who are returning. Right. 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 They were on, out on leave and, right. and that. Yeah, and also, some, right. Right. Uh, excuse me, some, some long-term subs, the principals have put in the position, uh, the long-term sub is doing a great job, and they're working with us to try to see if that long-term sub can get certified and possibly be a pipeline for hire. So there's a lot of different nuances in terms of what that long-term sub is doing. I'm happy to provide the long-term sub information that the system provided me. I just, I didn't include it here, but I'm, sure. I'm happy to share it. Yeah. Um, but again, I think that's, that if there's a Venn diagram of vacancies that aren't showing here, I think that would be sort of mm -hmm. what we'd want to piece out. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, if somebody, a long-term sub who is there because somebody is going to be coming back and filling that spot, I think those numbers would be, certainly we want to have those separated out. If it's a long-term sub that's doing a, a great job and we hope to encourage them and help them to get through the certification process, I think we should still count that as a vacancy because that is someone that we are looking to recruit. Um, and so that is, a, you know, that's a recruitment space that I think we need to be accounting for. And then also, um, you know, vacancies that are, you know, contract employees, for example, um, in, in, for other positions um, where ideally, right, we want those to eventually be, you know, non-contract employees, which comes with a, a, a much lower price tag, certainly, um, as well as many other benefits. Um, it would be great to just have those numbers broken out again so that we know exactly how many positions we're looking to recruit for ultimately. Appreciate that. And you know, you're making me think of another point is when we come back, obviously let's get this information in the short term, but I think we should just have a session in the NC on recruitment and retention and hiring and just where things are. Um, so we'll have you back, uh, mm -hmm. hopefully with sans nasal drip at that point you know, <laughs> for you, but to just kind of get a sense of, of that number, you know, because one of the questions I, I have, for example, which is, you know, just the number of principal administrators and teachers who are in the retirement pipeline, you know, like how I know you guys are tracking and monitoring that, but I think we need, you know, I think that context is important for folks to understand, you know, there's a smaller pool of 
educators. Here's who's retiring. Just like any other profession we're dealing with, with the baby boomers and all that, how are we managing that? What's our plan? Where are people at? How that connects to this issue of long-term subs and all that. So I think we need to have a session on it. And just real quickly, as an example as to why this this is so important that we give that really complete picture, the numbers I'm looking at from uh, March 29th, the total number of vacancies, including full-time and part-time, for elementary school uh, is listed here as 277, whereas in the packet we have, as of January, it's 50. Um, so for middle school, I have 134. So um, yeah, I, I think having all of those numbers would be really helpful for the conversation. Right. So that's the same chart, and this, yeah, we had a chart that's not in the package, just for folks wondering, this number is as of January in the packet, but we re received something from external parties that gave us the March number, mm -hmm. which showed, for example, the elementary vacancy at 277 within a two-month period, so. Oh, well, one is, the, uh, those are the new allocations going for uh, FY24. Uh, in terms of what you saw in January, we're still vacancies from FY23. So again, it is a, a moving target, but staffing went out in February, and then we went through our voluntary transfer, our involuntary and voluntary transfer periods, and those, I think, reflect uh, positions that are being filled for FY24. Understood. Yeah, it's helpful. Yeah, so obviously it's a up and down. Okay. You good? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. All right, let's continue. Um, the last uh, topic in this section of the packet is um, just wanted to discuss a little bit the impact of the blueprint for Maryland's future on the operating budget expenditures. Um, as noted above, certainly, again, there's fluctuation in the state aid for um, MCPS related to Blueprint, um, but there are a number of um, requirements and priorities that will have an impact both in FY24 and in future years on local funding. Um, MCPS identified uh, a number of, of, of the 24 accelerators as needed to directly meet Blueprint legislation requirements, and those are on page 17 of your packet. They total about $8.5 million and relate um, in large part to um, the number of the career and college readiness priorities of Blueprint, um, as well as a coordinator, which um, certainly, uh, given the scope, uh, makes a lot of sense um, to add to that uh, office. But at any rate, again, a lot of the direct accelerators that are identified here relate to the college and career readiness. Um, those are areas that will grow. Um, there's a presentation that is attached in your packet that outlines a number of the implementation steps underway and looking ahead in the future across uh, all of the blueprint areas. And the council staff has just highlight, highlighted a little bit here in terms of, again, this is an area with significant future impact. Um, there will be a number of areas here that will continue to grow. Our efforts will grow, which is positive, um, and also our financial uh, requirements will grow, which is less positive, but certainly part of the um, experience of supporting the um, the critical efforts. Um, community schools is one such area. There are 26 currently. MCPS reports eight more in FY24. Um, as has been mentioned, there are a number of salary increases related, and one related to specific increases for national board certified teachers. I know we're certainly very proud of the fact that we uh, in MCPS have the largest number of teachers working towards that certification in the state. Um, Pre-K is a huge area of growth, and we'll be talking more about that in the joint committee work session. Um, and of course, the committee has talked also about the CIP. Um, I think just a concluding thought on this, um, I think the blueprint structures, really, again, there's a lot in flux around that. And I think that as that goes forward, this will be an ongoing conversation around how is the overarching structure of the budget of MCPS uh, as MCPS continues to integrate these priorities? How does that move forward in a way that really is, is an opportunity? And I think the opportunity that Blueprint um, intends to support uh, to really re envision not only the structure of the budget, but really the structure of a lot of these services and of the programs um, in that, on that innovative front. Uh, so, again, that will be an ongoing discussion um, uh, for the committee. I appreciate that, and I just want to say, you know, one of the things that several of the high school students I've talked to is about these dual enrollment and AP and IB fees that you've talked about that the Blueprint requires, and just just like anything, it's such a great thing that we have that 
availability, but getting it out there more and making sure people know that they can apply and uh, that's always a challenge. But it's I'm great. It's great that that's in here uh, and just lifting up the community schools work uh, and expansion that is just a great model and you know I, the the blueprint really kind of lays a great foundation that we can build upon. But to the point that Ms. McGuire makes, we need to factor in how we're going to continue the the march. Mm -hmm. You know, as as the the funding from the state diminishes, you know. So, go ahead. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando. Um, so the blueprint is a, it, it should serve as the north star for improving public education across the state. Um, one thing we have to continue to consider here in Montgomery County is it's a framework. And so with it being implemented, you know, in many ways as a framework with some particular criteria areas that it, it hopes to uh, achieve, um, it's also an opportunity in which it should inform how we transform areas of public education. And Montgomery County, I've constantly said and will continue to say, will have to lead this work in the state for a number of different reasons. One, we are the largest. Two, uh, many of the programs that are already in the, the blueprint have been programs that we've started. Um, in many ways, it's helped us to accelerate, like the continuation of the dual enrollment um, program that has been successful and has grown consistently in Montgomery County Public Schools. And so it is going to be one of the biggest factors that we have to continue to talk about, to your point, Councilmember Abernose, predicting what costs are going to be in the future. And so the blueprint will be one that we project um, next year, the following year, the following year after that, um, until we achieve its full implementation, but be able to say, you know, what are we going to be able to accomplish in this blueprint in Montgomery County, and what are we going to be able to manage in terms of funding and how we're going to do that. So I see this as a, a leading part of our discussion in future budgets. Thank you. That concludes the operating budget overview for today in this work session. The next item is the technology modernization project in the CIP. Which yep. So we'll take that up. There's a lot of interesting stuff in here. We, we are on time. So um, let's, uh, let's go right into that. Yeah. So um, the... Do we need to do any transition up here? Are you all st for tech mod? Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Go ahead. The um, technology modernization project is in the capital improvements program. Uh, we do tend to talk about it as part of the operating budget discussions, though, in part because there's such a tight programmatic nexus with the operating budget, and also it is um, almost exclusively funded with current revenue, which, uh, of course, is an operating budget resource as well. Um, and so that is, again, the timing is often that we talk about it here. There, uh, the county executive, the board did not request any changes to the technology modernization project as approved in the CIP and the executive uh, also did not make any recommendation for amendments or changes. So the amount that you have before you for appropriation in FY24 is $2.664 million and again that is at the approved level um, that was predicted. 26, right? I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I just took away $60 million. The um, two, 26 $0.664 million. I apologize. Um, so that is the amount of the appropriation for FY24, and again, that's the approved level. MCPS has provided the breakdown of the Tech Mod project itself here on page 19 of your packet, um, but MCPS also provided um, a significant amount of update information to help uh, just, again, contextualize for the committee the efforts around um, the uh, devices that students have access to at home, what was mentioned earlier around the hotspots, um, as well as um, other supports that, um, that MCPS provides to really ensure that students have equitable access and full access to the technology that, of course, is so integral to the educational program. So if the committee has questions about that, I'm sure uh, representatives are happy to talk about them. One piece um, that I just want to add, um, each year also MCPS participates in the federal E-rate reimbursement program. This is a federal program where school systems and also libraries can receive um, reimbursement rates for certain eligible expenditures. We've been doing this for a number of years and the cycle tends to be that um, the, the practice has been for the committee to um, uh, envision that the ultimate reimbursement 
when MCPS receives it will be appropriated on top of the appropriation. So the 2.664 is in county funds, and at some point next spring, probably right around this time, we will receive um, a request to actually draw down those funds. The, the appropriation is always at the end of the year because MCPS has to wait uh, and see what the feds um, say that they're eligible for after the expenditures have been put forward. So we should be receiving the FY23 reimbursement um, appropriation request very shortly um, and again can process that quickly to be sure that um, that all stays moving forward. Uh, council staff supports the recommended approval of the funding level. Thank you. Um, any you're, you're up here, so you might as well introduce us. You know, we, I'll, I'll, I'll tee up a softball for you around, you know, like, you know, we get the Chromebook question, the Promethean board question a lot, um, but, you know, is there anything you think we need to be aware of as far as the tech mod budget and things that are happening in your world, if you want to introduce yourself? Yes, absolutely. My name is Stephanie Sharon. I'm the Chief of Strategic Initiatives. Um, first of all, we want to thank the, the Council for uh, providing us this opportunity to have these funds every year and have done so for quite, quite a, a long time. One thing that I do want to stress is that when we think about technology, technology serves as an accelerator to equity in this district. And one of the things that we have learned as a result of the pandemic is that technology is no longer optional. Right. Um, if anything, we are continuously expanding our in, our uh, footprint in order to make sure that we're not just meeting the needs of our students, but we're ensuring that our staff have the tools that they need to be able to create robust and engaging opportunities for all of our learners. As you noted, um, we have the interactive panels. Uh, we now don't we, we Promethean boards. The last time we kind of did a big, huge surge of money around Promethean boards was around 2008, 2009. So a lot of that technology is really timing out. It's been about 15 years. So we have been slowly but surely utilizing our ESSER funds for interactive panels, which are a much more robust interactive technology and teaching tool than the Promethean boards were. What is also important um, to note around that is that a, a large chunk of our ESSER money, because it is a one-time cost, they do last about 15 years, is utilized, has been utilized for the, uh, for the interactive panels, but we still have more spaces that are going to need. We actually get this almost daily from, from teachers. They're mobile as well, and we are constantly asked, can we have more, can we have more, because they see the benefits of this. Um, interactive panels have never been covered in the cost of CIP. Um, um, so we are we utilized ESSER, and we also are thinking about how we're utilizing other funds in order to make sure that we replace all of those effectively. In addition, while we've used CIP for our Chromebook costs and the maintenance of those, um, we've actually increased our footprint significantly around Chromebooks. So the cost of that, um, as well as the utilization of that, um, is going to be critical as we move forward. The maintenance of these, um, we get a lot of questions frequently where we say, well, how many Chromebooks do you really need every year, right? Um, the reality is... Um, we need my household. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And as we think about being an accelerator of equity in the district, um, it was the it is the vision of the superintendent and the district and the board of education that every child has what they need, not only at school but at home as well, so that we're making sure that we can support students robustly. So in addition to the hotspots, which also were a ESSER funded project, we have between twelve and thirteen thousand hot hotspots that go out, um, and that we really want to continue to maintain that internet connectivity for our families. Chromebooks are, are another, another um, huge component of, of, our, of our teaching and learning program. One of the things that I did want to note is that, you know, while we, we are on a one-to-one -one ratio for our students to have Chromebooks, it is really important um, to note that our Chromebooks are on a five-year cycle. Now, Chromebooks can last more than five years. I mean, I actually have an old one my son has had that we just purchased ourselves long before five years. <laughs> But we cannot use those Chromebooks in an instructional setting because of testing requirements. The, after five years, they don't have the software upload abilities to be able to be um, to be able to be compliant with the state testing requirements. But what we do is, is we make sure we utilize every single opportunity to save a, a, our technology. So we use the older Chromebooks to ensure that if a child needs an additional Chromebook at home and they have one at school and they can have one at home, we use those older Chromebooks to, to create um, opportunities for that digital divide. So I just wanted to make sure that I noted that. 
Um, the other thing that I want to note, because Dr. McKnight has mentioned it um, uh, repeatedly in the presentation today, is really around how, when we think about technology being a great accelerator for equity, some of the innovative work that we're trying to do, and that's really what TechMod was all about, right, is innovating with technology. Um, some of the projects that we're putting forth, we did engage in a showcase where we had teachers come in and not only look at teacher devices um, that they could use and choose from, in the future to maximize their ability, but also to take a look at different instructional tools that can en enhance their current instructional program. This inc includes everything from robotics kits to virtual reality. We even have green screens and drones, 3D printers. These are some of the things that we're piloting as innovative technologies to really engage our learners on all levels and help develop those 21st century skills. We had a huge turnout. Um, of teachers that are now begging for that technology everywhere because they were so excited. And we know we can't obviously provide that for every single person, but we are uh, initiating a study next year of 10 schools that we're calling iIdea schools. Uh, they are innovative schools for educational design, and they have been identified to get some of this robust technology. We're going to be studying how it enhances the teaching and learning environment and what the effect is going to be specifically on math and reading um, um, on our literacy scores in those 10 schools. Uh, we're going to be providing professional learning because this really is the wave of the future. When we think about instruction, we no longer can separate instruction from technology. It is one and the same. Um, and we want to make sure that we're providing all of our kids that opportunity. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando, and thank you, Ms. Sharon, for so eloquently sharing that uh, picture of what we look to achieve in Montgomery County Public Schools. I did want to share with you, because this is important to many of our residents who've uh, shared this with me, you know, when I came into the position as superintendent and spent some time in community conversations. There were some really key points that I took away. One, many of our community members wondered, how can we get access to things like the um, digital printers, the, the technology, outside of needing to go into a specific program in MCPS. Because how can my child still access these types of resources if they are not, if their enrollment has gone up and there's not the capacity in a particular program for one reason or another. And so when we think about the great equity equalizer and technology representing itself in that way, this is one of the reasons, as Ms. Sharon just stated, that we look to expand that into schools, not just into programs. And piloting allows us to be able to, again, look at the return on investment because the technology is just not, just not about a component of engagement, but we actually want to see how is it impacting literacy and mathematics as one of the uh, academic two of the academic milestones that we will continue to monitor in a student's experience in Montgomery County from kindergarten to high school. And so when you look at technology, you know, it's some in some ways many looked at it as an operational piece. No, it's actually a leverage for teaching and learning in the way that we're utilizing it and trying to expand services to more of our schools that are not just program exclusive, which came directly from our community members. Appreciate that. Yeah. Councilman Ray. It's exciting. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'd love to le learn more. I know we don't have a ton of time, but I just wanted to, um, you said that the, the pilot would start when? What was the timeline that name? Well, we got two pilots going on. Okay. So for the, the 10. Uh, the 10 I idea schools are going to be, they're starting um, professional learning this summer, and they will be launched with all of their technology in the fall. We had a very high interest. It was hard to narrow, but based on funding, we had to narrow. Okay, and then can you tell us what the 10 schools are and just very briefly how they were selected? So I don't have the list of the 10 schools, but we can follow up and give you all that information. That sounds good. Um, then just very briefly how they were selected. Yes, so one of the things is we took a look at what exists in current schools and programs. We focused this on elementary. This is where we see the biggest divide with uh, technology opportunities and STEAM-based opportunities is in elementary. So this pilot is focused in elementary schools, and we did a couple things to analyze that. One, we asked for interest. We didn't want to load up schools with another initiative, so we actually sent out and did some interests uh, opportunities and had um, some focus group conversations with a bunch of principals. And then we also wanted to look at it through the lens of equity to see where our underserved uh, communities are. We know um, in a lot of our underserved communities, they have less access to some of these STEAM programs. So we did make sure that we did an extra push when, when we did the interest-based opportunities in those areas. Great. Thank you. Great. Uh, Councilmember Alvarez. 
Thanks. So um, how long is the evaluation going to take? So that is something that we're still going to have to work out with our Office of Shared Accountability. Um, usually when we have, want to see implementation, implementation takes three years to actually, three to five years to see actual results. But we're going to be doing ongoing monitoring throughout all of next year to take a look at the efficacy of this. We usually start off with just the implementation component of the evaluation first. So how is it being implemented? Um, is it being implemented with fidelity? How are teachers utilizing the technology? What do they use? Um, we're not going to see academic results probably immediately, but we will be monitoring them along the way. No matter how many students per, per school will be able to participate? All of the students, because we're they're going to be full school pilots with the technology. We don't we, we wanted to do this in a way that we were as Dr. McKnight said, really opening up the opportunity for all and not just being about a particular program or a particular grade level. So they are full school pilots. That's great. Um, there's a lot of federal resources available in yes. this space. We actually just recently tried to hire somebody who was going to help us access some of those federal resources, but that fell through momentarily. Mm -hmm. So, um, and obviously the county is very much engaged, and I know you guys interact with them um, on, on, on an ongoing basis, but um, I do think we should be aggressive. We've got hopefully more than two years of the Biden administration, year and a half at this point, um, but let's take advantage of this time and see if we can aggressively go after resources. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Couldn't agree more, and I think uh, you're hearing the excitement. I think we need an education committee uh, field trip. Oh my God, we would love that. To, uh, <laughs> to try to test this out, you know, and just make sure do some real on the ground accountability. Um, I, I did want to ask one question. Uh, you know, in the in the uh, packet that you submitted, that this issue of one of the things that we hear from time to time. We talked about the age, the age, and the of our workforce right, and the comfortability or lack thereof with devices and technology as just an ongoing issue in the world. So anything you have in the world is going to translate. Um, and how that, what that means for professional development and how we make sure people are comfortable using tools. You know, I've been in some classrooms where, like, you know, you've got the, uh, the, the activity board going and kids are up at the screen. It's like it's just, like, seamless. And I've been in others where it's, like, just sitting there and people aren't as comfortable. So, uh, and I know one of the things you did that you talk about in the, in the packet here is this teacher choice pilot of like what, who's comfortable with what, you know, and, and what devices. So maybe t t use this as an opportunity to talk about that and how you're just addressing that overall issue as we move towards, you know, what is a necessary move towards more of this utilization of technology. Yes, absolutely. And this is actually was very timely today as Dr. Trenkamp and I were coming over here and we were talking about updates. We were actually talking about the teacher choice pilot. They are getting delivered their devices within the next few days. Um, so we were able to, yes, yes. So we have heard a lot of interest over really, I would say it really elevated when we, when the pandemic started and we had to make sure that every teacher had a device in their hands very, very quickly. Um, and in that process, we learned and got a lot of feedback from our teachers around the fact that they're saying this device is not doing what I need it to do or why can't I have a choice in device? I feel like it could potentially elevate my teaching opportunities with students if I got an opportunity to choose. So based on that um, information, we wanted to pilot the opportunity for teachers to actually have a choice in the main instructional device that they utilize in the classroom every day. Um, this is relatively innovative. Most districts our size do not provide choice in, in teacher devices. So this is a really innovative way to look at how we're serving our um, teaching staff. So a part of that process, and I think this is, this is where some of the innovation really came out, is that we could have sat in a room with a bunch of technology folks and said, let's narrow down the choices of the device, and then we're just going to call up some schools and we're going to say, here you go, you got the choice between these four devices, which ones do you want? But we knew that really wasn't going to be serving the need of our constituents. And in an effort to ensure that we were showing true and authentic collaborations with our association partners and with the um, teachers that we serve every day, we spun it on its head a little bit. And that's where that teacher device showcase that Dr. McKnight mentioned came into play. 
what the technology folks did is they they gathered, I think we had over 50 different devices, at teacher devices, adult devices at this showcase. The teachers were an integral part in determining what the choice options were going to be. They came in, we had well over a thousand teachers cycle through in one day of this device showcase. They came through, they test drove the devices, they evaluated the devices to determine what was beneficial of some versus not beneficial of others. Um, how were they going to utilize it? They gave robust feedback on all of that. We took all of that from, from the showcase, and then we used that to narrow down the devices that they had to choose from. I will say that based on the actual orders that we, we've done, some very interesting data came into play. I think in our head, what we thought teachers were going to want versus what they actually wanted was very different. So what we heard from our teachers is we had about 27% of our teachers said, we want to keep our device. Like in those three pilot schools, we want to keep our device. We're good. We feel this meets, meets our needs. We then had a, our next largest in elementary school said, we want to keep our device, but we want a high-end Chromebook that stays in the classroom, that's hooked up to the interactive panel, that I don't have to hook, unhook, hook, unhook, and then I can have my other device, my regular teacher device, be mobile. In the high school, it was the opposite a little bit. They said, we still want to keep our device, we want desktops in the classroom hooked up to the um, interactive panel because so many high school teachers float from classroom to classroom and it, and it saved them time. Um, our smallest percentages uh, were around uh, we, the MacBook, we, the high-end MacBook, and then we had a high-end high um, PC. Um, that uh, laptop that, that was chosen. But it was interesting because we never really thought about that dual um, need, but that really was where our teachers were telling us that's really what they needed and they wanted. So we're really excited to study this, particularly in how it can relate to increasing teacher retention. This is this could be potentially a really great way to say this is another thing we can offer you in MCPS that you might not get in the, the surrounding counties. So you said the devices are coming out this month, and then you're going to study it through the end of the year, right? Actually, we're studying it through December. Um, the reason we're studying it through December is one time. We want to give people time to actually be utilizing the device. The other reason is, is, is by December of next year, we're going to have to start our full-blown teacher tech device uh, refresh cycle um, for FY25. So if we're going to go to a more robust choice model, we need to think about the budgetary implications of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great great to hear. Yes, Council Member Thanks. Um, what's the acronym again for the 10 school? I IDEA and uh, Dr. Trenkamp, what does the IDEA stand for? Innovative Instructional Design for edu Educational Advancement? Equitable for Equitable Access, for equitable access. yes. Yes. <laughs> Innovative Instructional Design for Equitable Access. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I IDEA. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, great. Okay. So, yeah, I was wondering if for as part of the IIDEA program, or I know I've heard from some elementary school teachers, obviously we know that they're extremely overburdened. Um, they have the kids, you know, pretty much all, all day. Um, and, um, you know, if there is potential here for there to be a tech special class as opposed to, um, you know, integration into the regular classroom, if that could serve dual purposes of, you know, giving that opportunity to the students as well as providing some additional planning time to, to teachers. Um, you know, and I don't know, would the results for students, you know, be better one way or the other way? I don't know. Is there, I wonder if there's uh, a way or if it's worth considering an integration of that into the pilot program, if that's something you're already thinking about or any thoughts on that? I think there was some thinking about how, how we could utilize that, that different types of models, particularly in the IIDEA schools. I think what's really important to note is that we want the technology to be an enhancement to their, to their instructional planning program and not a burden. And I think they obviously are going to need plan, uh, a time to plan to do those things. So some of those things we are taking a look at is whether or not that technology can be used to enhance potentially additional, um, electives or what are they called special excuse me at the elementary level but that is something that is more on a on a individual school basis but it's definitely something that we're considering helping to support
Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I mean, as part of the the feedback, I mean, I know that you start with looking at the fidelity of the implementation and 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 all of that. Um, but it might be useful to get feedback from the teachers as well on their thoughts about what that kind of formatting um, could look like, or if now the technology is so <laughs> central, um, quite potentially, you know, to their teaching that that's really you know the, the only thing that makes sense. But that might be something worth considering, considering since we're also thinking about recruitment, retention, planning time, um, all of those elements, and trying to find ways to make that happen. Good. Thank you. Um, all right, I think this item, do we need to take an action on this item? The committee would now would be a good time to indicate your recommendation. Yeah, I think we, I think without objection, we will recommend that the uh, technology modernization CRP project move forward to full council. So um, with that, uh, if there aren't, do you have anything you want to say as we close out? You don't have to. <laughs> Go ahead. I will always say thank you for the opportunity to have the discussion today. Um, a number of great questions came up that I think will allow us to be able to come and have future discussions to be more specific in these areas around staffing, safety, and security, and of course the conversation of defining accountability and what does that look like will continue to occur as we do that in partnership with you. So again, thank you so much for um, hosting us in this first discussion around the operating budget, and uh, we thank you and look forward to the future discussion. Discussions. Yes, sir. And I'd also like to thank the staff as well. So many of them did come out. Uh, Councilmember Jawanda, you said that it looks like it was a quarter of them here. Um, you know, they are invested in making sure that we um, have a healthy conversation for you and for those who have an interest in understanding this budget. No, this is great. I appreciate it. And the fact that we were able to call someone up who had more specific information, that's a, I, that's, that's a great thing. Go ahead. You want to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, just briefly. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. I'm excited about you know the partnership that we're that we have uh, and about the the shared efforts around uh, accountability and transparency and, and just clarity that we're going to have moving forward. Uh, and, and I think we're in a great place with that. Um, and I also just wanted to mention as a side note as we look forward to our future conversations um, that having the bargaining. I know you all are, are hard at work at, at the bargaining table. Um, are it would be, certainly be my hope that if it's possible to get some things settled on the earlier end, I know easier said than done, but that will really help us um, as we make these budgetary decisions. It's just very hard to make the, you know, these, these big decisions if we don't have this enormous piece of the pie kind of settled and to be able to say, we, you know, this is exactly where this, this funding is going. So uh, I know you're hard at work. Whatever you can do to, you know, to, to keep the parties at, at that table and get, the, get it done would be really helpful on our end. Yeah, thank you, Councilman. We're not subject to those negotiations, but we, we would love to know, you know, obviously. Um, and just for staff, I also want to thank Ms. McGuire. I have a list that my staff put together, data on the fund balances for similar jurisdictions that are comparable. I know you were taking notes. MCPS providing more ESSER category and projected timeline for some of that spending. Uh, vacancies, long-term subs, we talked about that. Numbers of teachers, administrators, and principals nearing retirement. This is what I had asked. And then um, these schools that are participating in the I idea, <laughs> I idea, innovative instructional design for equity and access program. Um, there you go. There you go. Um, and I don't know if, the, if there's anything else. I just want to make sure we're very clear that we, when we have follow-up items, that we're following up on them. So, uh, and obviously, Mr. McGuire will follow up if there's anything. Councilman Robert, you want to say anything? All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. McKnight and team. And we will see you all on. Uh, tomorrow. Uh, some of you tomorrow and then some of you next week. All right. We are adjourned.